Tor, <coughs> could I please have everyone back at the table for online? Right. So welcome back to the Planning, Environment and Parks Committee. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to all of you back in the public forum and all members of staff and everyone else here as well. Um, thank you to IMSB, sorry about the um, chopping and changing in times, but thank you for being here and understanding the, the extraordinary items that were coming before us. Right, I opened with a karakia before the governing body, so now we will move to our apologies. We have absence from Councillor Fully, lateness from Deputy Mayor, Council, um, Deputy, sorry, <laughs> Deputy Simpson. Deputy Mayor, Councillor Desley Simpson on council business. Um, Chris is here, and I don't think there was any request for early departure. Nope. Could I have a, I'll get, oh, sorry. Sorry, I do now have a request for early departure at 5 p.m. if we're not finished by then. Okay, Thank we will you. work our best to be finished well before that. Thank you, Councillor Ferry. Um, sorry, Chair, early departure to um, 3.45. Thank you. Get uh, Deputy Chair, Councillor Dalton to move that. I have a seconder. Cool. Member Ashby. All those in favour? Um, to the, we got an email on a, online, so we will just acknowledge that Councillor Leone and Councillor Baker are online, but we don't have to approve their attendance. Uh, Declarations of interest, there are none that I know of. Anybody? No. Our confirmation of the minutes from last time. Could I have a mover? Councillor Walker. Councillor Walker. Seconder. Deputy Chair. Councillor Dalton. All those in favour? Aye. Anyone opposed? No. There are no petitions. <coughs> Very large agenda today, and we are already now uh, an hour and a half behind due to the extraordinary governing body before this. So we have a number of... Am I going to go through them one by one, or do I just go to... Oh, I didn't realise. West Auckland, they've withdrawn. Okay. Right. So we've had... Now we have up next, I'm assuming Quiet Sky Waiheke is here. Sorry, I didn't have a chance to come out and... Meet you before. Kia ora, so who uh, are you, Kim? What are you? Yes, I am. Cool. Kia ora. We have um, we have five minutes of speaking, um, which. Oh. Yeah, sorry about that. The mic sometimes. So we have a five minute five minute section um, for you to present. We try and have questions within that five minutes, but we know that it, that period and sometimes goes over. But we'll try and keep it contained. But you do have five minutes. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, I'd first like to apologise that you may have received a great number of emails just in the last few days. Um, one of the reasons that Quiet Sky was set up was so that we could field a lot of the complaints. We found it a bit ironic that the planners were using the fact that we are now fielding all the complaints and they're not receiving them as a reason not to do anything. Um, so I do apologise that you may have received a great deal in the last few days. They'll stop, I assure you. Ne never apologise for public feedback. Okay. Um, look, I've only got five minutes. I, you have all seen the submission that Quiet Sky has made. Um, it's on the record. Um, I just want to talk about just one very important aspect of it. I want to introduce you to this beautiful island, Motukaha. Um, it's a small island just off the uh, southwest coast of Waiheke. It's a very, very important island because, and it's recognised that as a site of ecological significance, recognised by the council. The reason is because it is the home of these. This is um, what is known as Matuka Moana or the reef heron, Egretta sacra sacra. You may not recognize it, not surprising that there are only three to four hundred of these birds in New Zealand. It is recognized as a nationally endangered species. For exactly this sort of bird, this sort of location, in 2010, the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement 
was introduced, a national policy. This replaced, and I want to emphasize this, the 1994 New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. It was said very clearly, all local authorities were required to give effect under the RMA as soon as practical to this piece of national legislation. How is it possible then that just a couple of weeks ago, as you'll see from the picture on the left, on the right, sorry, that the planners consented a helipad with a flight path going slack bang over the top of this environmentally sensitive area? What do you think Mr. and Mrs. Igreta Sacra Sacra are going to do? They are not going to breed there. It's not how many helicopters, the very first one that comes over will be enough. So this isn't just an isolated case. And what's ironic, Mr Chair, is the, the planner's own practice and guidance note on helicopters says very specifically, resource consent applications for helicopter landing areas within the coastal environment should be supported by an assessment against the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement and supporting expert re reporting, including on biodiversity. This isn't the only one. All around Waiheke, we have coastal locations. I'm talking about 13 years since the planners were asked, were requested to give effect to this piece of national legislation as soon as practicable. There's one particular one I'll draw your attention to right down at the very bottom of that picture. Those were two helipads which were consented for the same owner so he could fly in even more often and they go straight over Tamatuku Bay. This is a site of extreme importance. Let me just give you a quick view. There are others on there that also go over important environmental sites. This is the list of the, th of the classification of bird species from Tamatuku Bay, which these helicopters are going to be flying just a few feet above. Not only are they, some of them nationally, some of them have international protection, such as the New Zealand Dottrell, because they are so rare. How can the planners claim that they are taking into account the New Zealand coastal policy? The fact of the matter is they aren't. They have not done so. Okay? It's very clear from the New Zealand, it said very clearly, local authorities must amend regional policy statements in order to give effect to the New Zealand government. They have been ignoring national laws. Okay? This has gone on now for 13 years. What you're being asked to do again is go on ignoring the national laws. Go on. Is that my four minute call? No. Uh, so I've heard at the local board, the Waikiki local, the other, a planner trying to justify this. It was like a scene out of Yes Minister. It is completely untrue that they have given effect to this. Don't be confused by a lot of doublespeak. I'm afraid there is a, they, they are using the art of obfuscation. They've done it with local boards. They're going to try and do it again with you. The simple fact of the matter is they have not done what they should have done or started to do 13 years ago. They haven't even looked at it. We've recently had a paper done. This paper by a recognised... A marine, a marine biologist, which shows all of this is showing that there are extreme effects on the environment, on endangered species. They have not even got somebody to do that. They have done nothing to apply the New Zealand coastal policy to give effect to it that they should have done 13 years ago. This is a time for them to do it. They need, you need to review the Haraka Gulf Islands district plan and give effect to this piece of national legislation. Do not let them kick the ball down the road again, Mr Chair. They will say, ah, we will look at it in four years' time. They said that before. It won't be four. It'll probably be ten years before anything is done. Meantime, more and more endangered species will be affected by consenting helicopters in areas where they should not be consented. Good. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for that um, very clear presentation. Um, I don't have any, I assume there are questions for you? Uh, Councillor Sayers. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. So the question is, you mentioned about that needs to be changes to the Hauraki Gulf Regional Plan, was it? It's a Hauraki, Hauraki, Hauraki Island, uh, Gulf Islands District Plan, District is plan. the one I'm referring to. So do you it's got nothing to do with the marine plan. Okay, thank you. So uh, do you know when that's coming up on the horizon for our opportunity to look at that? Do, do you know well, that? what the, what the, it was meant to come up to be uh, reviewed, to be integrated in the Orkin Union Plan in 2020. It was deferred again. It's now being suggested it will happen in another three years. Will it happen then? That's when they start. It'll take a number of years to do it. By which time this will happen. And I should add that if you don't decide to do it, Somebody will take this to the Environment Court, and then it may cost the council a great deal more money than doing it yourselves. I've just this morning had somebody come and say, we have a retired judge living near us. He says, legally, you guys are absolutely right. Very good. Uh, thank, you. thank you for the answer. Any other questions? Oh, well, thank you. Oh, Councillor Ferry. Sorry, I was trying to work out if I could Google the answer, but I haven't done it in time. So, with your, I don't know if I can beat Google. Yeah. Uh, with your map of Waiheke... Um, oh, do you want me to the, go back to it? Yeah, uh, the different... I? Oh, I don't, I don't know, know if I can. you can. I'm... Yeah. The different colours for that you've got red, orange and blue helipads. Yep. Thank you, staff. Um, can you just explain what the difference is well, the one, those uh, the, the, the red one um, is one that we have no objection to whatsoever. Okay. It is the Westpac helicopter. And again, this was brought up Excuse in the me. meeting. About, we are not against we, against essential helicopters. We're not against the use of the police helicopters. We are against non-essential use of helicopters. Okay. That's nothing. We don't be confused by them saying, oh, a lot of these flights have gone in a Westpac. We love Westpac, particularly when you get to my age. So and, the, and some of the other ones are the ones that are in the process, hasn't been updated, but they're in the process of being consented. Okay. So, the, so it's going to go, the numbers are going to go on growing. We're up to 64. I predicted a couple of years ago that we'd be at 100 in five years. I think that was an underestimate. So, that, so just to clarify, so the orange ones, they're the ones that are under consent at the moment? I think they all are. Some of them, I... I this hasn't been updated recently. Some of those may well have already been consented. Okay, the, the number that you should consented. know is 64, as we understand it at the moment, okay. 64 and growing. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks. Thank you very much. We don't have any more questions, so thank you. We will be debating both um, items to come, and we're, I'm going to ask some of the questions you asked at the item rather than trying to do it now. So thank you very, thank you very much, much for your time. I will just get um, Councillor Lee, would you like to move? Yes, I'm happy to move it. Cool. And, and a seconder, Councillor Walker. All those in favour? Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Now, just for... Um, I see there's a number of people filming in here, and that's public space, but it would be good if we could just film there because people's emails and things are open, people are working on their screen, so if, if that's okay, if we can just film from here and try and avoid any filming of councillors' computers, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, cool. Next up, we have the Hearn Bay Residents Association. We've got Dirk Hudig. Sorry, I think I've only got one name, so if you could both introduce yourself and we'll get. Um, Don Matheson, D-O-N, was it? Cool. Thank you. Thank you. We'll make sure that your names are both recorded. If you just want to speak, you've got the um, talk button to the right there, and you've got your five minutes starting now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> I'll just put up the... <coughs> We've had a lot of problems with consent, uh, with uh, compliance issues. And the main issues that... Uh, that, that uh, relevant and noise, flight path, and helicopter type. Um, and we heard uh, the other day at the uh, <coughs> local board meeting that the council officers do not measure noise because it's too expensive. 
And uh, the other issue with flight paths is that pilots uh, operate under CAA rules, not under Auckland consent rules. So pilots may use different flight paths than, than are consented, and that's, that's life. Uh, flight paths are also unver unverifiable because in our area, transponders, which record the, where, where these, these planes go, do not have to be on, and many people turn them off. So <clears throat> flight path deviation, in fact, affect other people for noise because the consents themselves measure the noise depend and as measured on the flight path that they're supposed to take. If they take a different flight path, then a whole different set of people and properties are affected by the noise from the helicopter. And these people have not been consented, have not been considered at all during the consenting process. Then there is the issue about complaints. Public can't access the consent conditions because they're not published. So if somebody has a consent, you can't find out what, what they're supposed to do. And there's also no easy way to complain about helicopters because if you go to the council website, then there's nothing there that, 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 that's for you to, to fill in. Um, council itself does not audit compliance at all and replies on, uh, relies on complaints. And it is just very, very, very difficult to successfully complain, complain with the council. Uh, even if you ring the, the number, there's no option. It gives you a hold of options. There's no options for helicopter complaints. So I'm not surprised that you're not getting too many complaints. We do get them, but, uh, but, but you don't. Uh, whether that's by design or, or omission, I don't know. Uh, <coughs> Council deals with consent holders. We believe that consent holders should be able to prove compliance. If they can't prove compliance, then there's a problem. It would, such proving that would require transponders to be on at all times. So the consents don't require that. You could still require it by ensuring that if there is a complaint and the, and the, and the uh, consent holder can't prove that he complies, that he should have his transponder on. And council should check noise complaints. It's not too expensive. If you're not going uh, to be prepared to uh, put up with the expense, then you shouldn't be uh, making these consents. And the last thing is consents are required to be monitored by the, the consents a uh, consent holder is required to pay for their own monitoring. So it's no cost to the council. So it doesn't matter whether, whether, whether it's expensive or not. We just now go to a suspected breach, the, uh, to a breach follow-up that hasn't happened. It's a group of townhouses uh, <coughs> and the consent holder has changed the helicopter uh, that he uses. The townhouses say that the noise is much louder than it was originally. The council has been made aware of this uh, but nothing's ever happened. And let's face it, consenting and compliance is a mess. It's a real mess. It needs attention. And the councillors should demand uh, attention. We'll leave this up to, you can read the, the, the rest of this, uh, and I'll turn the page over and open for questions. We are open for questions. Thank you very much. Very clear presentation again. Um, Councillor Lee, did you have a question? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and, and good morning, gentlemen. Um, obviously, this is not a, a new issue, and there's been media coverage about this, particularly in your area, for some years now. Um, it's a complex issue on the face of it, but in, in the view of, of, of your association, what, be, what would be the simplest um, lawful way to resolve this matter once and for all? I would hope that there is a review of the requirements for investigation of complaints, and I'd hope that we would be consulted uh, when that is being designed. And it should be done 
yesterday. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Nope. Thank you both, and we'll be debating both the papers in the next little while, so you're welcome to stay. So we'll just get... Councillor Lee, would you like to move again? And Councillor Ferry would like to second. All those in favour? Anyone opposed? No, nope. thank you. Thank you both very much. Okay, just Jeanette? Yes. Cool, so next up we have Quiet Sky Waitamata, and so we have Jeanette Budget here. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, and once again you have um, five minutes speaking. Press on the right there, the talk. Yeah, perfect. It is now, it, it is Jeanette Budget indeed. Budget with two Ts. And for the record, I don't support the budget cuts. Um, I'm here, however, to talk about um, helicopters. Um, in Waitamata, um, um, we're here because we believe that private helicopter use, in particular in residential areas, threatens Auckland's vision, commendable vision, of a sustainable, compact and livable city. With urban growth and intensification, the stakes get ever higher. Uh, we are working for a future that preserves quiet skies and peaceful communities. We do support um, public safety helicopters, of course, Westpac, all of that we completely accept. We oppose um, private helicopters in residential zones. Um, we know um, the general public don't want helicopters in their neighbourhoods. We know because we've asked them. 3,000 people in the Waitamata and Gulf um, ward have signed a petition to that effect. 130 people wrote to oppose the consent variation to increase helicopter flights at a property in Hearn Bay. This apparently was a much higher number than is usual. Um, it, the council complaints register in no way um, records the, the high public feeling about private helicopters in Auckland. It, you know, it's nearly impossible to record a complaint and um, we think council should be listening to these significant numbers. We, we'd really um, question who benefits from private helicopters. <coughs> It's a handful of people who, as far as we can see, could drive a few kilometres to a heliport. We're not here to suggest where those other heliports might be, but commercial heliports seem like a really sensible solution to this. This image shows the properties in Herne Bay with helipads, and I think it's kind of instructive. Two of the properties are large holdings, uh, one is probably a thousand square metres, a smaller one, 15 Cremorne Street, about a thousand square metres, about 20 metres wide, this section, uh, right beside a public reserve. Um, no accounting for the people who use that beach and reserve when these consents were um, allowed. We wonder what the users of the beach um, might experience when both... Uh, helipads are being used. We we um, we wonder about the property in between, and if they were to apply for a helipad, yes, they would certainly need their neighbour's consent, and it's the, it, they might get it. But you know, how, how does council kind of anticipate uh, the cumulative effects of helipads? They're very very close to each other. Um, I'm just going to skip, I'll come back to that other slide. So our concern is, is um, goes far beyond private property interests. Um, we're here for the people who use the beaches and the foreshore. This image shows scouts kayaking in Cox's Bay. They're really concerned about a proposal to put a helipad on that point just behind them. Um, that point, incidentally, um, is home to a very significant roost of oyster catchers. Um, what about the environment and the law? 
you know, because helicopters rely on seeing the harbour as a kind of aerial um, motorway, they are um, always on the coast. Auckland has a very long coastline, thank you, and um, the Waitamata is a rich uh, area for birds, the banded dotterels, the dotterels, the New Zealand dotterels, and the Caspian tones that Kim mentioned, all live in Cox's Bay, adjacent to Miola Reef, which of course is a special ecological area. So there's plenty of bird life to be protected um, in right in our harbour next to the city. Council appears to be ignoring its own helicopter practice guidance note in this regard, and we're just simply not seeing the robust assessments of environmental effect that we could expect to see. And what about the money? That, which is a bit topical at the moment. Council panels tell us it would cost 250k to make a plan change. That, I, I will go as far as to say, is that won't cover the case of a community fighting a single helicopter through the courts. That's a single case. Um, we understand risk of litigation from would-be helicopter owners um, stops council regulating them properly. We'd like to understand more about this issue. We, we don't get it. We don't get the rationale. We consider council's exposure to legal risk by not giving effect to the law. The coastal policy statement, the noise rules um, may cost them a lot more um, in terms of class action suits. Let's think more long term about this. We've all got better things to do than than debate helicopters, we argue that prohibiting helicopters will save us all a lot of money. So what should happen? We don't think the current AUP helicopter rules are fit for purpose. They don't give effect to the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. They don't, it doesn't recognise the rights of the public and reserves and foreshore or the wildlife that lives there. Uh, Helicopter noise infuriates and enra enrages many of us. Um, and, you know, acoustic modelling by consultants is just a mathematical model. It always disagrees depending on who's paid for the report. And uh, there is a um, rule that averages noise levels. It's a bit of a nonsense if you've got two or three helicopters lined up on adjacent properties. Um, our simple and urgent message today is please make helicopters in residential zones a prohibited activity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions, Jeanette? No questions? Cool, thank you very much. Um, we'll have a mover. Councillor Darby, seconder. Councillor Watson, those in favour? Next public input item. All right, we have local board. Um, we had one request received in time from Kath Handley, Chair of the Waikiko. A hero of a hero of many people in the room. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me before I arrived, um, kia ora, uh, Chair Tenakoto Katoa, Mayor. Um, this has been a long time coming. It's been coming since the Hauraki Gulf Islands District Plan was uh, introduced. For me, I just want to say first, you may not even have read the motion. It wasn't our motion which was passed last Wednesday. It was an original motion, wasn't posted until last night. So if you read your papers before that, and I hope now that you will find that attachment with our motion because it goes to the heart of what we're looking for here. Um, the reports we received last week are not the reports you have in front of us, are in front of you, with respect to either that from Council's Planning Policy Unit or the Helicopter Activity Compliance Monitoring Findings. Our discussion with the writers of both those reports have led to changes, material changes, which we, of course, only received when we got the, the paper, as you did yesterday. Um, the, paper, the paper, particularly from the Council's Planning Policy Units, is written for, to lead you to a conclusion which is based on subjective judgment statements and repeated use from the monitoring report of misrepresentative data. 
Notwithstanding the flaws in that report, the Waiheke Local Board acknowledges the changes that are now, have been written into the new reports. But we've been working on this, as has our community. So you've, the local board, by the way, endorses Quiet Sky Waiheke, and their report was attached to our motion so that you could not miss it. There are only two local boards based out in the Gulf on, the island, on islands, and we have one councillor around this table who also lives on an island. But the, the future of this issue rests with people who don't live there. So I would like you, please to engage with what those of us who represent the people of the Waiheke Island Local Board and Aotea Great Barrier are saying. It's really critically important now that we don't follow planner speak, but we listen to people speak. Today we are asking you to take a position and affirm some actions to put right some significant shortcomings since the introduction of the Hierarchy Gulf Islands Plan and adopt a commitment to two critical national standards that Auckland Council is yet to adopt. You've heard the arguments from Quiet Sky Waiheke for the adopt, adoption of the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement of 2010. The other standard is the National Planning Standard published on the 1st of 2019, Policy 15, Noise and Vibration, four years ago. We've been formally seeking options to deal with noise and vibration with you since late 2021. This national policy standard, I'll call it MPS 15, has never been proposed by plans and places and formal feedback to our board or to your previous planning committee, rather telling us why everything we ever suggested was impossible or too expensive, which itself is subjective. In March 2022, you were told that. It's always been possible, and last week when pushed, we got the answer that it could take as little as two weeks to implement. Nobody told you and nobody told us. I was the person who got this on their agenda because I persisted last year. I wrote, I asked, I got no answers, nothing. Finally, I engaged with Councillor Darby as chair of the committee and eventually I got a response in writing. Ah, yes, it is possible to implement NPS 15. But let's wait until after we get the helicopter compliance report, which has nothing to do with it. Like the New Zealand Coastal Policy stand Statement languishing in council, Council's policy cupboard since 2010, this national standard immediately calls into question many of the consents that have been approved over this period since MPF 15, MPS 15 was published. It could have been offered but was not. It's cheap, fast and actually fair. It is the national standard, and just briefly, if you haven't come across it yet in the papers, it says you can't average noise over three days. Oh, surprise. Noise happens in real time. So a helicopter landing and takeoff might be affecting you to the tune of about 85 or 86 decibels. But measured over three days, it's going to come in, if it's only done once, under 50 decibels. That's the difference. So nationally, they decided that was rubbish and got away with it, but we never changed anything. Last year, Doc, at my invitation, came and talked to us about the work they're doing on the experience and expectation of tranquility. They measure it scientifically. And we invited members of the planning committee and we invited the planners, and the planners have not taken this account into their report. It is the expectation of tranquility and the experience of it that are at the heart of the expectations of people living and visiting Hauraki Gulf Islands compared to living anywhere in the city. The central premise of the local board plan signed off and approved by the council is that Waiheke is a sanctuary in the Gulf. We're all obliged as elected members to fulfil that premise. The helicopter movement review notes it was conducted over the quietest periods of COVID. It introduces you to the notion that actually your own Waiheke is only affected by 3% of helicopter movements. That is rubbish. That is meaningless. That is measured. That measure says 
Where did that helicopter spend the longest time in air? And guess what? Coming from the North Shore, it flew right over the North Shore and then it landed on Waiheke and took off from Waiheke. But only the North Shore is recorded in that piece of data. I don't even know why that is reproduced. During the peak season, it goes on, and now this is in the main report. It says, during the peak season, there were more helicopter flights to and over Waiheke than there were over the rest of Auckland. But the rest of Auckland does not have an expectation of an experience of tranquility. You won't even hear a helicopter at a thousand feet. So even in midwinter, 28% of all flights landed on Waiheke or flew over Waiheke. I ask you to look at one diagram. It's page on page 87 of an item nine, attachment A. Look at where the lines cluster. That's just a single diagram of a day. They cluster over us. We've had enough we were, the options presented aren't options. You can actually run two options at once. I know that, I don't even think ART Great Barriers uh, motion is up with you yet, but you'll get it. They're actually asking for something quite different to us, but mostly the same. But you can do these things together. It said, this report says that the cost is too expensive. Well, guess what? We've all invested huge amounts of time. You have, I have, I go through every helicopter uh, application, helipad consent application and spend hours trying to demonstrate things like the fact that the residents next door are going to be affected, the fact that native birds are going to have, be impacted. You know, we've got two consents just in the last period right beside our only marine reserve. On the margin of that marine reserve, the helicopter comes in right over the marine reserve and lands on the edge of it, and the owner went for two consents and got them. This is, we have had enough. Today, please, listen to the islands. Listen to what it's like. Our experience and our expectation of tranquility is destroyed. Look at what it says in that report about climate change. It says, oh, by the way, it's only 7% of transport emissions, so hey, that's chicken feed. Well, actually, do you know how much a helicopter uses? Each helicopter produces 950 pounds of CO2 per hour and burns over 40 times the fuel of a passenger car per hour. That qualifies them as one of the most polluting carbon intense modes of transport. Every time, every time a helipad is consented, flights, are, additional flights are consented. So go on consenting helipads and go on building our carbon footprint. It's outrageous that 7% of emissions would be minimised like this in a report to you when you're committed to reduction of CO2 in our atmosphere, when we're already one of the dirtiest cities in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hanley, and just in case anyone challenges me, I did let you go four minutes over, but I know that you are speaking for other boards and a big community, and you've done a huge, 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 phenomenal amount of work in this space. And also thank you for inviting um, Deputy Chair Councillor Dalton and I over to um, yeah. the island. And, and yeah, so thank you very much. Um, I would like to move, um, we'll have questions actually. Um, so I think uh, Councillor Darby first, and then Councillor Lee after. Kia ora, Kath, and thanks for your impassioned plea. It's not the first one, it's probably about the tenth at least. Um, can you just give us an idea of uh, how many times have, have you seen a paper on your agenda at the Waheke Local Board on, on this matter? How many hundreds of hours do you think you've spent on this? And, what, and then going forward from that, I mean, what is the risk? And realistic, because I know you don't, you don't um, colour things up unnecessarily. Um, what do you think the risk is of um, judicial challenge by your community or possibly even your own board, Kath? That was the first part. I'll give you the second one too, Kath. Um, Carson Field is pretty central on the island, not like the ferry terminal. Um, 
Uh, from Carson Field, which is a commercial um, heliport and aerodrome, um, from there, um, how long does it take and can you get to the extreme parts of the islands, so the west and back to the east or right up to the northwest uh, by um, hire car or other vehicles? Yes. Um, are they, is that all available? I'm just getting a sense yeah. of proximity to the commercial services that go there. Uh, so the first is, um, I think, highly likely. You know, the longer this runs and the more ridiculous it gets, the more likely it is. Just as we've seen, I've got to say there is, um, just to explain this, the, the, a significant heli pad on Waiheke is excluded from the data, by the way, because it was a subject of a legal case at that time. And the findings are against the, the, um, this particular owner of the helipad. The neighbours of that helipad spent over a million dollars trying to control not just the helipad, it involved a restaurant and some other behaviours. So yes, there are people, and those are people who you would consider live in a relatively expensive part of Waiheke, uh, Church Bay. Um, but they were prepared to do it because of their expectation. They've invested in living on a lifestyle block, the people who've done this. They've invested to live there and to live a, a, a life of relative quiet. So I would say very high and I think highly challengeable, as are, I believe, the way that the, uh, the Hauraki Gulf Island District Plan has, been cho has chosen to be... Uh, how it informs, uh, how council has chosen to, uh, what's the word, what the matters of discretion that council planners have determined they can consider. So that is put outside, it doesn't matter how often I raise the planning standards, it, they're just outside the terms of reference that have been determined by council planners to be part of discretionary consideration. So that's the first answer. If you were to land at the airfield, and I have to say that is on one of the busiest flight paths for multiple other helipads and the Westpac Helicopter Trust, that has not been consulted in this. And I know the Chief Executive of the Northern District Helicopter Trust, which includes the Westpac Helicopter for Auckland, they are concerned. Uh, they are concerned because of the huge frequency of helicopter flights on the same flight path as both the airfield and the Westpac helipad. But if you arrived at the airfield, Carson's airfield, by car, 20 minutes to any point. So it's, because it's right in the, the heart, and it really only takes 20 minutes to get to the other end of the island, what we call the eastern end or the bottom end of the island. Thank you, Kath. Um, <coughs> Councillor Lee. Hey, thank you very much, Kath, um, and thanks for the compelling presentation. Um, in terms of the um, long overdue adoption of uh, National Planning Standard 15 um, in the Hauraki Gulf Islands District Plan, um, would there be any concern um, that this would in effect um, align um, Waiheke uh, and, and Aotea Great Barrier with the situation in the city. Um, and as we're hearing from um, people in the city, that is not actually satisfactory. What, what's your view on that? Oh gosh. Now that, to be honest, I haven't looked at it from the perspective of the people in the city. So I don't, I don't find that easy to answer. They haven't asked for what we've asked for, which, um, so I think that would be a case for you to discuss with them. But on National Planning Standard 15, we're all aligned. Yes, just to introduce it. For five grand, just get it done, because that's a simple one. For us, it is the Hauraki Gulf Islands District Plan. And it is different for, the, for those seeking, I think this needs to be said, the reason that we aren't seeking uh, a prohibited status for Waiheke is that we have been told very clearly that the, that the demands that would be made on proof and uh, to get there, or the evidentiary nature of moving to 
being prohibited is a, 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 on a scale way beyond what we are seeking. So we are seeking, if you like, to move things into a discretionary a, a, and or a introduction of the standards rather than restricted discretionary so that anything can move something into being a notified consent and contestable by the public. And it's really only because we've been told it's uh, to reach the threshold of evidence for prohibited is way too expensive. So we've heard that. This has been, this is advice from who? Uh, from planning. Plans from? and places. Plans and places, so. Okay, yeah. plan, from the council, that, from council, council, from council from staff. Council, yeah. So there's, um, just make, I'll just make the point that the Altair Great Barrier Board heard the same advice, yeah. and they're pushing, they're saying that the national planning standard is an interim step, it's certainly supported with urgency, but it's only an interim step, and they believe that the best answer would be prohibited activity. Yeah. yeah. I can see that for the intention of the Hauraki Gulf Island District Plan is really interesting because it immediately in the helicopter section says that there are two islands where you can only have one helipad. And it names those islands. It then goes on to say at the end, there is a postscript saying that actually for Rakino Island, which is also one of our, uh, with an Aurohi, uh, that Rakino should also only have one. And that any uh, helipads, and I'm coming to the point here, any helipads contemplated for Rakino, if they were to be um, approved prior to council indicating whether one helipad was, they can only be done on a time limit, you know, they'll be time limited. Well, guess what? There is already one helipad there, and we'll be looking at that consent to see if it's time limited. And just in the last two weeks, we've had two more applications for Rakino. And when I wrote to the planner about those, he said, actually, gosh, yes, those are points we need to consider. I think that the Hauraki District, uh, Hauraki Gulf Islands District Plan, when it was written, it contemplated a minimum number of helipads to make the islands accessible in one way by helicopter. They didn't contemplate this. This, you saw it, the map. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you, Councillor Lee and Chair Hadley. Um, Councillor Ferry, you have a question. Thank you very much for this and um, acknowledging, yeah, the, the Carson Field is right in the middle of the island. Um, so thank you for that question, Councillor Darby. I had two questions. Um, one goes to the, the um, image that you pointed us to that was in the um, papers with the lines. Very powerful image. Um, and when uh, Dirk spoke before from, the, from Hearn Bay, he mentioned that a lot of the helicopters don't have their transponders on. Yep. And so I just wanted to understand that that image, is that, does that in, is that covering every helicopter or will there be a lot of data potentially missing from that? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. question. It could exclude some data, um, but I can't speak to that particular diagram. Okay. But our experience over the last years is as soon as helicopter, helipad, this became an issue, transponders were turned off. Right. So, and that's because then we couldn't track them. So I hear a helicopter, I did this morning and I looked for it and it wasn't on the flight radar, right? right? Yeah. It's still happening, but probably not to the same extent since Council introduced the compliance report and knew, and everybody knew in the industry that there was somebody doing a retrospective review of compliance. Okay. So they are more compliant now, I believe, but regardless, it's, and Council has now, in, in, when they um, uh, give a new consent for a helipad, included that they must have transponders on as a consent condition to the helipad, and it's up to the owner of the helipad to ensure that. But yeah, if you're looking retrospectively, you could be missing all sorts of, uh, all sorts of data, yep. but regardless, it's a compelling diagram. It just shows you where yeah. we're living. You know, apocalypse now, well, yeah. brilliant, right in the middle of a, a precious environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other query I had, um, was the other point I thought you made, which was particularly compelling, was um, about the climate impact and the emissions from the helicopters. And I guess there's a question for Council here about, um, you know, if, if we're discouraging private car use, 
um, and giving incentives for other means of transport, are we sort of, I guess, setting a bit of a a bit of a double standard um, when we allow people to use a, a vehicle that's actually much Sorry, more Mr. Chair, I'm finding it very hard to hear the question because of the chat around the table. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah, sorry. So the question was um, in relation to if we're, as a council, incentivising people not using private cars, but it seems we're not, we're, there's a bit of double standard here around helipads that we're sort of saying actually, yeah, you, you can have a helipad at, at your place though, even though those are much higher emission vehicles. Yep. So I just wondered what your reflection was on that. Uh, I think it was probably in the tone I used at the time, Councillor Ferry, which is, it's, uh, it is absolutely a double standard. You're either committed to reductions in CO2 or not, and at the moment they're not using, there will be electric flights, but we've got Carsons, you know, Carsons have, are already, you know, moving into that zero carbon space as an airfield, they're looking to achieve that. Uh, and eventually we'll get there, I'm sure, with helicopters. Um, but for now, a consent for a helipad is a consent for helicopter use on multiple occasions. So yes, that's a consent for using an incredible amount of CO2 emission or emitting an incredible amount of CO2 per person travelling. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Filipina. Thank you, Chair. Tell me quick, Kath, how are you? Talo for lava. Mahalo, sui for. I know you would have read item 10 that's on our agenda with the options that are available to this particular committee. Uh, there is a preferred option that's there. Uh, I'll be interested to see what your views are in regards to option three. Uh, that's we have proposed in our motion that option two is just adopted, that National Planning Standard 15, if I'm remembering correctly, because I don't have it in front of me. And that option three is a revision of the some of the um, Hauraki Gulf Island District Plan provisions. So we are asking for option three as well for a whole raft of reasons. So if you went to the attachment with our motion in it, it gives a laundry list of reasons to, <laughs> to make the change to the Hauraki Gulf Island District Plan as well, but it's going to take longer. So if we introduce MPS 15 now, that would immediately have prevented some of the fly of the helipads that have been consented. If you go, you know, Waiheke and you know Onivaro Beach, one of the most delightful places to be, surrounded by like, some housing and some bush. And at the top of the bush now, a helipad and the flight path straight in over all those boaties, including the mayor, uh, down in the harbour, and over, you know, in over the village, and able to take off and land at will, even though most of the time they won't be able to use that flight path because of the prevailing conditions, so they'll come in over the houses. So that's because a flight path is it's a nominal thing, right? It's you pilot it's pilot's discretion whether you use the flight path because of weather conditions. And, and Kath, just through you, chair, just last um, part. I, is, look on sixty one um, in in the agenda, there is a, a, a section in here that that states this option would significantly change. This is in regards to option three. I just want to get your view to see whether this is correct or not. That to change the HGI plans helipad rules as sought by the Waiheke and Aotea Great Barrier Local Boards. Would that statement be correct? Sorry, I'm going to have to find it. It's, it's just got here. I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, I just wanted to see whether that particular statement would be correct, and that is this option would significantly change the HGI plans helipad rules as sought by the Waiheke and Aotea Great Barrier Local Boards. Um, that's option three. I just wanted to uh, see whether that yeah, would yes, be that a true that statement. Yes, that is correct. Thank that, you. That is what we have been seeking, yeah. but please look, for, I'm speaking, I can't speak for RT Great Barrier, but please look at their motion, because for reasons which are to do with mana whenua, protecting their environment as well, they are wanting uh, option four, I understand, but... You know, I won't be able to speak to that. But yes, that is correct. Kilda, thank, thank you. Thank you, you Chair. Prime Minister Chairman, Altair Great Barrier Local Board support option four 
prohibited activity status. No, I've read the report, Councillor Lee. I just wanted to get uh, 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 at, at least an answer from Kath in regards to that particular section. I've, I've read the report, but thank you so much for your you should need clarification. The, you, you need to read the resolutions of the yeah, Altair I, Great I, Barrier I've read Local everything, Board. Councillor Lee. Thank I just wanted a response. Thank you so much thank for your you, help. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Chair Hanley, if that's all the questions we have. Thank you for um, all your feedback we do have, and I'm happy to, if you're sticking around for lunch, discuss some of the, the thoughts I've had, obviously, with um, option two with urgency is definitely, we're going to change that to urgency, and then looking at how we can incorporate option three as soon as possible. Um, that's sort of looking like where we're, where we're heading with some other additional things around making it easier on the council website, things like that. I will say that I'm not putting up the prohibited um, as a chair's rec at this stage, that may come up as amendment, but yep. um, because of the advice we have that nigh impossible to, to do that, and, and um, but that may come up in debate. So I'll Great. discuss with Councillor Lee and Councillor Darby and maybe yourself in the lunch break if you're around. So. Tatoko Chair, and thank you everybody. Kia ora. Um, so Councillor, <laughs> Councillor Lee, I, I assume very um, highly that you would like to move uh, the recommendation. I'll get Councillor Darby to second because of his work on this as well. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No, thank you. Right, we move to extraordinary items. There are no extraordinary items. We then move to item eight. And just for um, warning, we're going to do item eight, then we'll, we'll go to lunch after, yes. after that, and then we can get helicopters, um, both reports done after that, um, as we started a bit later today, it's probably <coughs> going to make sense to do it that way. Kia ora, David, thank you. If you'd like to talk about the report and then we'll move to discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, ko David McIntosh, toko anaya. Um, I'm Senior Advisory Events with uh, Regional Services and Strategy. Um, this uh, um, event funding report is our standard report. It's uh, the second for this um, financial year, and um, we have made a proposal to allocate grants to six events. Um, five of these are um, events that we've funded in the past, um, and one is a new one. Um, as uh, per our as, um, a standard approach, we allocate um, funding for regional events on a sort of a contributory basis. We're one of a number of funders for the events. Normally, we're not sort of a major funder, so we're only, only um, providing a portion of their, their funding. And we sort of aim in our funding recommendations to maintain some level of consistency between the um, events um, of a similar nature. Um, so that's probably the, the only things I'd highlight at the moment, so take any questions. Thank you very much and thanks for a fulsome report, um, lots of information there. Are there any questions? Oh, Councillor Philippine. Thank you, Chair. Kilda David. David, um, it's in regards to the 98,500 be applied to meet Council savings targets. <laughs> Out of the applications that you have received, which you've outlined, are there any of those, if we hadn't put this 98,500 in, that could have benefited from that money? Um, I, th I think most of them, um, this is the sort of amount that they'd be expecting from us. We did um, take the opportunity to re uh, recommend um, extra funding for Polyfest, um, noting the, the increased costs they're incurring with uh, having to split the event into two with them the Māori stage um, coming in later due to conflicts with Te Mata um, And um, the, the other one, the, the new event, the Matariki event, um, we think the level that we've recommended there is sort of consistent with our sort of um, funding of, of other similar events. So, yeah, we didn't really have a strong case for, for allocating extra to any of those events. Just for clarification, sorry, um, Chair. No, um, how many applications did you receive for this, the, the, the last of the funding? I think in the report was about 14. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so out of the 
the, the applications, and when I look through the, uh, the reasons why, were there any that didn't end up make getting oh. the, 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 the budget that we, you're currently allocating mm. could have been put on as a result of the $98,500? Could there mm. have been, for those that missed out, the opportunity to put that event on? Um, with those ones, um, we really didn't think they were highly aligned with our um, policy priorities. Um, so it sort of, um, I guess, we thought it was more appropriate that they not be granted funding, even though some of them, you know, in their own rights, they, you know, good events, but they don't don't really meet most. A number were smaller events which don't meet regional criteria and others weren't really in the, our areas of focus for the event funding. Okay, can I just ask one more because, look, I just need to push this a little bit more. David, if we, don't, if we didn't find ourselves in the situation that's been put out there to, in regards to this annual plan, would the money that you have left been allocated to any of those events from the panel that didn't make the cut? Um, no, that would, wouldn't have formed part of our recommendation. Is Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was my uh, question too. So the drive to decline those would have happened regardless of the, mm. the saving. Confirm that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Baker. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, and uh, David, I'm struggling to actually put this into a question because I I struggled with this um, the whole regional events thing, and um, as opposed to against local board, um, you know why why these these events aren't being funded through local boards? And I recognise some of them having come to the, our local board previously, um, and so I guess I read through the applications and I read the alignment to the regional uh, the regional event key priorities. Um, and I really struggle to find any regional basis for them at all, to be honest. And, and, and so, Chair, I'm, I'm struggling with the question because I question the whole point of these types of regional um, uh, event funding when they are generally going for small localised events with very little regional reach. And so potentially it's a thing that we need to look at in terms of our entire um, the basis of these because I'm, I really struggle with it. I won't be voting against it because that would be unfair. But um, I just want to, I guess, flag that I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with this, uh, the whole regional event funding. Um, I think it's not not right, but sorry, I don't have a real question there, Matt, but I'm struggling with it a whole lot. I question the whole lot. No, that's um, fine for a comment, but maybe if I could form it to a question to David, I guess, would you, you have declined many of the others because of their more local focus than regional. How would how would these six, I guess, assist as reaching the regional sort of threshold for an event? Um, it, it's um, it's the reach across the region and the scale of the events, and that's that's one of the or two of the distinguishing um, factors there. Um, I, I guess you look at something like Polyfest that you know is definitely regional because it goes beyond individual boards. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's, um, I guess, the the Matariki event um, that's coming um, out west. That that would be have multi board reach in the same way that the Waitangi Day event out west does. It's sort of, and um, that's you know very popular and, and brings in people from you know quite far away. Um, and I, so. Yeah, I think these even um, some that are a bit smaller, that they're sort of in a niche area that um, you know we do have people coming from you know across the region. So let's see, and and they would probably um, struggle to achieve the level of support um, if they were going to just individual boards. Good, thank you, Councillor Watson. Yeah, just a very quick one, David. Just looking for a little bit more detail on the um, the. Uh, Auckland Model United Nations a application. I, I read through the application um, and certainly appeared to have a you know a regional reach in terms of getting out to people even though the, <coughs> potentially I guess the number of people who are attracted is, is far smaller. Was that the basis o o on which that one was um, you know largely re refused or rejected? 
Um, with those um, types of events, we've had applications in the past and we've, of similar types of activities where it's, um, I guess, workshop-style activities, and we don't haven't really seen those as a core area of focus um, because there is actually quite a range of those sorts of things that happen, and it would be hard to distinguish you know, one against another to prioritise, and so we wouldn't be able to also fund a large number of them. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Walker. Sure. Um, I've just got a question around um, the evaluation in terms of shifting um, events to the point where they're sustainable, that is, they're not a cost to council or not a significant cost to council. Given that some of these events have been running for some time, are we... If you just want to move your mic towards you, sorry, Councillor. Sure. Uh, do you have any um, projections for uh, these uh, amounts reducing over time? Uh, because that is the general approach that Council takes, I think, in terms of policy. I th think our approach with events is, is maybe a little bit different to other activities in that, uh, that we fund through grants, so the arts, um, arts grants. Um, events are uh, generally recurring annually for a period of time. They seek to obtain funding from um, a range of grant funders and also sponsorship. Um, we believe that by providing a small portion of their funding on a consistent basis uh, over an, uh, a number of years, um, that makes them, I guess, a bit more sustainable in terms of they're not, um, they're, their funding is spread across a range of funders rather than um, being locked up into a fewer number and then being at risk of, um, say, one of those withdrawing. Um, so it is, that's why we generally are only funding a small portion of the, um, the events costs. So I, I understand that. My question is around whether we seek to reduce our funding commitment over time so that we're then in a position to make money available to other um, events. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, uh, Polyfest has been going for a number of years now. Uh, we provide significant support, help get it off the ground. Um, I'm assuming that over time a successful event might attract some ticketing, might attract significant sponsorship and the like, and we are able to reduce our commitment. I don't know whether that's the case or not, and I'm just asking whether <coughs> we've got a drive to do that. Um, no, it isn't something that we've actually we've taken that approach, but I, I guess it would be an alternative way of, um, if it the um, committee thought that we should um, reconsider that. Um, we could do it differently in future. As far as I know, the uh, Polyfest budget is quite large. That we're we are still a small portion. Yeah, it's um, we're fund at the level we're funding about five percent of their costs. Yeah, good. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ferry. Thanks. Um, not sure if this is a fair question to ask you, but we'll give it a go, eh? Um, so with these events, um, and a number of them did come to um, local board when I was on a local board, uh, and often we would decline them because we would say you need to apply to the regional one because this is actually a regional event. So there is this um, tricky balance here, which, which Andy alluded to as well. Um, do you see if the if the the proposed budget goes through, these won't be funded anymore from this pool, will they? Is that correct? I just want to get that straight. Um, well, I guess that's a, a budget decision that. Um, yeah. Mm. Okay. Through, through the chair, look, um, Justine. I know you're online. I'm just wondering whether you had uh, wanted to respond to that, Justine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Megan, and uh, through the chair, uh, yes, to support David, I guess uh, we, uh, you know, the budgets are under proposal, of course, and haven't been decided, but it is correct that the regional events grant funding would be impacted by the budget proposals. Okay, thank you, and I don't know who to direct this one to, but 
Um, is there any other proposed pool of money that council would have that these these events could potentially apply to instead? Um, based on the budget proposal, uh, no. That is why I tried to make clear within the supporting information yep. uh, what will be reduced and what will stop. Okay, and, and a final question, and this is um, probably another one of my um, newbie ones. Is it is it normal to have that much left over in terms of unallocated? Is that a, a normal level of... I mean, I, I, in local board land, we usually try and allocate every cent. So um, wanting to understand, is it is it normal to have that level of unallocated funds? And given this is round two as well, did we have a lot of unallocated funds from the first round? Um, this um, the, generally we've um, in the past have fully allocated the the funds. Um, these last this year and last year um, we haven't, um, and some of that has been due to events not proceeding, um, and also a shift in timing for for some of them. And they've sort of we had some that. Um, took up grants and then had to delay their events. So it's the um, it's it's sort of the whole cycle has got disrupted a bit, and it's um, it's you know not not ideal. But um, yeah, so we I mean I, I've had that experience with local board grants as well, where you know an event's been cancelled, say because of the weather, um, and um, the provision is I mean that doesn't actually affect too much how much we allocate. It means they have to pay it back. And that's the arrangement with the grant. So I can understand why there might have been um, fewer applications in the last few years because of the disruption. But I guess the idea that people might have to cancel their event, I wouldn't have thought automatically results in fewer applications for um, that reason, because there is that provision to, to pay it back if you don't pay if you don't hold the event. Yeah, we've had, had probably it's um, it's it been more a case of maybe deferring the event. Some of them, are, and so we left the funding with them to, to go to a later date. Right. So okay. it's. Um, okay. Thank you. And just um, thank you, and just uh, confirming this will, if the budget proposal as, consulted on, it will mean there'll be zero budget for this. Just confirming. You said impacted, Justine, but I just want to know that, the budget proposal would mean that there is no funding at all for. Regional events. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Darby. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks for your work, David. Um, probably for, for you, Megan, and my question does not diminish the contributions that I've heard from the councillors today, but Megan, you've heard me before. We're, 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 the primary consideration today is to approve um, the recommendations. Um, I've seen these recommendations come um, regularly, and we approve them uh, because we've set the criteria, and that's the key key decision I think we should be making. But Megan, I question the value of continuing to bring these as reports. Um, you know, there's one way to create um, space to deal with what we really need to be dealing with here, possibly even a planned change on helicopters, um, that we actually um, delegate authority to our staff. Set the criteria every three years, but delegate authority. Where, where are we up to on that consideration, as I've put to you prior, Megan? Uh, I can probably answer for it. We, we obviously have had a lot on our plate, but we had decided not to address this directly until we have seen the budget, because we're coming up with a plan for changing the way we do things and then two months later not have this process anymore at all seemed like a bit of a waste of officer time. So if there is if there happens to be a change in what was proposed in the budget and there is um, grants, then we're going to assess it in that case. Megan may have other comments. No, through the Chair, that, that's right. Thanks, Councillor Darby. Uh, so it still is on our radar, but just given the, uh, you know, with the new term and the process we're going through here, it would appear, it would seem that the budget decision, whatever happens there, is a good opportunity then to see um, how you might want to go forward and whether there's some delegations that could be, uh, that could be done instead. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Bartley. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, David. I just wanted to know, um, does Council have the capacity to run these events themselves? Um, no, uh, I guess 
fully um, committed to the events and staffed for the, the events we do have our, on our own programme. So, so uh, if we are to pull the funding, um, how, how will these, how will council still be able to support these events? Um, well, we wouldn't have any direct ability to do do that. There is, um, I guess, there is some advice that events get and support through the facilitation permit and permitting process, um, but not um, to the extent um, that would replace this, this the loss of this funding. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank Actually, I did want to ask. Um, so you know how in the report it mentions diversification. Um, is that to try and prepare the organisers for the potential uh, repercussions of the, the budget? Um, no, there's, there's nothing in, in this, this report that um, prejudges any of that. This has continued to um, approach it on the, the way we've done in the past. Okay, thank you. You had a good question. Thanks, Councillor. Um, thank you, David. We will um, move to debate on this item now um, so you can step back from the table. Thank you, and thank you, Justine, as well, online. Uh, so, Councillor Filippini would like to move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Bartley. I saw first. Sorry, Councillor Henderson. I'll, I promise you can have something later. Um, are there any uh, comments on this? Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Filippini. Well, you Actually, what I'll do is I'll um, close the debate, if that's okay, as the mover, and see if there's any... Any other uh, comments? Yeah. Oh, sorry. There are no other comments, so you can I open... Oh, sorry, Councillor yeah. Bartley. I just wanted to thank the staff for the report. Uh, I also wanted to um, acknowledge all these community organisations that put on these events for us, because these uh, events actually are a way... It's not that they're coming to us and asking us for money. It's that they're actually helping us be able to meet our obligations and legislative responsibilities to achieve the four well-beings in the local government legislation. So they're actually helping us make this city better. So I do, I do want to acknowledge all these events, the multicultural aspect to it, bringing everyone together, social cohesion is so vital, especially now uh, post-COVID, post the floods. So um, yeah, I will leave it there. I won't go any further because I'll save that for the budget debate, but just acknowledging the staff for this report and these organisations. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, thank you really quick. Just following up on Councillor Bartley here. Um, I want to just acknowledge the diversity that's really represented in these events, that, that we really have uh, um, a large cross-section of Aucklanders and uh, showing different cultures that we can all access and it's really beautiful. That we can support these events really helps us enrich our city uh, and, as Councillor Bartley said, uh, discharges our legislative ob obligations as well under the four wellbeings. Um, we always have uh, this debate, and we have had for many years, around regional versus local and where does kind of a sub-regional element fit in there. Um, that's something that I think for future policy debate we should be looking at uh, kind of behind closed doors and working on. Uh, but I think these really are regional events that touch the lives of many, many Aucklanders. Thank you. You to thank you, Councillor. And yeah, I'd just like to thank staff as well. And you know, funding these events, we do they only are a small portion of the overall that many, mostly volunteers, go out and try to get from sponsors, whether they're private, community, philanthropic, um, and they do their best to get as much as they can for these events, which are mostly free, so they're accessible to all people in our communities. And we um, quite proudly are also like to partner with such important events for our city. Um, because if we were trying to fund them or have them uh, get off the ground just with council or ratepayer funds, that would be a significant cost. Um, so just want to acknowledge all the groups and going forward, um, we will be working with them, whatever the budget is, to, to see how we can support. Um, yes, so Councillor Filipina to close. Thank you, Chair. And uh, just to want to reinforce the comments that have been made. Chair, I think um, Councillor Baker um, ended up mentioning, you know, the, the uh, around um, regional events or not. But nine years ago, there was some work done 
um, uh, around which was regional, uh, sub-regional, that, that work uh, with our staff is still there. So if we want to pull that up at some stage, no problems at all. Uh, for the sake of $600,000 cut, um, the comments that have been made by the three speakers, uh, that's what is, is, is currently on the block. Um, all the diversity, all the events that we put on. Um, so look, but that's, that's a debate we will have around this annual plan. Um, but just be very clear, that's, that's exactly what's on the block. And, it, and, and that's our input in regards to a lot of the events that make Tamaki Makoto. So I will be supporting um, this, obviously. And, and just one, one last comment um, I, I want to make, Chair, is that um, depending on how we get on with the discussion around um, the annual plan, um, if this uh, fund in, in particular survives, I, I would then be pushing through your committee, um, Chair, uh, the bringing back of multi-year funding for some of the major events um, that are currently on the chopping block. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you very much, Councillor Philippina. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Oh, thank you. Welcome, Deputy Mayor. And we are now going to go to lunch. So we will have... Um, we will come back at 1.30. Oh, everything. There is no, um, I've, I've provided biscuits, but there is, there is no lunch, so I will see you back here at 1.30.
Now moving to, we have everyone back. We are now moving to item nine, the helicopter activity compliance monitoring findings. We've got Graham and Adrian coming to the table. They have a presentation and then we'll move to questions. But just to be clear, there is the make sure um, questions and debate on these two different papers are, we try and keep them separate. So this will be on the, the compliance and then 10 is around the planning and the options and the future. Um, so we'll try and try our best to keep those uh, two separate. Right, thank you. Kia ora kata. Um, my name's Adrian Wilson. I'm manager for proactive compliance within licensing and the regulatory compliance. And my colleague is... Graham Jones. Sorry. Graham Jones. Uh, Graham is one of our uh, compliance project specialists and uh, has done the research into this uh, report that we're going to present to you. Um, I'm not going to read through it all because you appreciate it. it's a very long report and I hope you've all had the opportunity to read it. So we put a few slides together just to go through some of those findings and, and, and sort of explain those. Uh, and I also take the opportunity to address some of those issues that have been raised by the uh, previous uh, presentations that have been made to you. Next slide. Oh, sorry, I've got it in the clicker. Um, this research was obviously to look at compliance activity uh, over a 12-month period initially, um, uh, which was from uh, 21st of the... Oh, tell a lie. From the um, uh, 6th of the 4th to uh, 21 to 6th of the 4th, 22, which is when we were first asked to uh, do this research. Um, we obviously realised we've got to compile a lot of data uh, in relation to it, so we used various sources uh, to obtain that data, and one of those was Flight Radar 24, which was mentioned previously uh, when the resolution was first made. Um, Flight Radar 24 is um, a co commercially available app that uh, you can subscribe to, and Council subscribed soon after we were asked to do this, so we could get the late or the up-to-date data, plus historical data on flight activity in the area. Um, in addition, um, we realised that uh, there was other sources of information out there to obtain our data, so one of them being... So ADSB Exchange is not a, a, a commercial um, uh, website or uh, etc. It's an open source, so anybody can log into this. We've just logged into this today. Uh, you'll see all the planes live moving and the aircraft moving up there. That's New York. Clearly it's quite busy over America at this moment in time. Um, and that's, that's live data. So that's, that's flights taking off, landing all over the world. Um, and then we come into little old New Zealand. <laughs> so that's that's live imagery of uh, aircraft that are over um, Auckland, Iraqi Gulf now. Um, so you see the concentration of grey around by the airport. So that's obviously planes that are on the ground, got the transponders turned on and uh, uh, ready to take off or have just landed. Um, we've got just a few light aircraft in the skies at the moment. Um, have we got any helicopters there, Graham, to hire? Yeah, we've got no helicopters in the air at the moment. I don't know why, but anyway, pick on a... So that just shows a, a light air, aircraft. It shows the type of light aircraft. It shows things like the hex number, which is an identifying feature of an aircraft. Uh, so that's got its transponder on. Um, looks like it's doing a bit of a... Is that Ardmore? I think it's probably taken off from. Uh, and it's, it's probably on a training flight or it may be on a, a tourist flight and that will show where it's been. There's a history tab on the left-hand column where you can actually see where that aircraft has been. Uh, I think it goes back about 12 months, ADSB exchange. So we can see what activities happened with that helicopter previously. And you can do searches on hex numbers as well. So individual aircraft, you can then start looking at their history. The colour on the bottom just shows the height that the uh, aircraft is travelling at. So that gives an indication whether something's taken off or coming into land or where it's land landed. Uh, and also that when you see a curl, you can see that it's turned around to approach a, a landing pad as well. Um, so that's just another fixed wing aircraft up there. We can do the next slide. It's very addictive, so please don't look at this because you'll be looking at it for hours and you'll be checking when you're next at the airport to see when your flight's coming in and out um, because it is very, very accurate. 
I must uh, hasten to add, this is not a government website. This is not something that's uh, fed through uh, necessarily official channels. Uh, it's the open source one for ADSB. They use enthusiasts. They use any sort of link or any information out there to provide that data. Flight Radar 24 is very similar. It's set flight, at, flight Radar 24 wants some money off you, and they make it a bit flasher in, in terms of that. And they go back three years in terms of some of the data that it. You can. can't opt out of ADSB. Um, so uh, Elon Musk will have paid Flight Radar 24 to stop people tracking his planes all over the world, and he would have been able to do that through paying a little fee to Flight Radar 24 to stop it. What that wouldn't do is necessarily remove his aircraft when his transponder's on. So you'd still be able to see the aircraft, you just wouldn't be able to track who it belongs to. ADSB don't do that. So that's the difference between the two. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, that's me. So this is um, one that was not in, in the um, uh, report, but this is one that we, we took out just to show some flight activity. So one of the things on ADSB Exchange, you can do a previous 48 hours. So it gives you a, a, a heat map of flight activity over the last two days. Uh, so that's one that we did for... Uh, Monday afternoon, I think. Monday afternoon, we did a, a previous 48 hours. So you'll see the clear concentration around Auckland Airport. You'll see those loops coming in uh, from left to right where they're, they're coming in and then approach the uh, airfield. You'll then see concentrations in the north, which will be up in Dairy Flat. Dairy Flat. So obviously Dairy Flat's a big training place for helicopters as well as fixed wing aircraft, hence why you get a big blob up there. Uh, Onihunga, we've got a heliport in Onihunga, that's why you get a lot of activity there. And again, Mechanics Bay, um, where you'll have the uh, Westpac and police helicopters going out from. So again, you see the activity there. And then out to your right, you'll see uh, Waiheke Island. It's not quite clear on the screen, but Waiheke Island and any flyovers and landings that take place there as well. So that's just to give you a concentration on what's happening at any one time over the skies of Auckland. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, me? Oh, sorry, I keep asking somebody else to do that. Um, so the data analysis went through uh, flight logs from the consented sites on Wahiki, Great Barrier Island, Wadamata, which was approximately 55 at the time of the analysis. I appreciate you've been told there's more than that now and there have been consents that have been issued since. But because, because we were looking at historical data, we could only go back on the consents that we, we currently had at the time. Um, there was 6,000 plus departures trapped between Albany, Onihunga and Mechanics Bay heliports. Um, whilst that's not consent and was not part of the scope, because of some of the concerns we had around transponders being turned off, which was addressed when this was first put out, um, we wanted to know what we didn't know. So it's all right looking at what we've got on our, or the information we've been given that somebody's turned off a transponder, but how do we know whether they're turning off a transponder if it's not on the screen? But what we realised is that most flights in and out of Waiheke come from Albany, Onihunga and Mechanics Bay. Those heliports have to have records and logs of all their in-going in and outgoing aircraft. That enabled us to then uh, get all those logs and see where they were going to. So they would say from Onihunga on this date, three flights went to Waiheke. Uh, and they would have landed at wherever they were, vineyard, etc. We could then cross-reference that to the Flight Radar 24 or ADSP Exchange to see whether that correlated with, with what the activity. That didn't lead us to believe that there was any widespread transponders being turned off because we found those flights and we found, found them on the tracking. Um, just an, another thing on transponders, uh, there is no legal requirement to have a transponder turned on in um, unmanaged airspace. So if, you're, if civil aviation don't need to know where you are and you're in a light aircraft and you're not in controlled airspace, you don't have to have your transponder turned on. In fact, sometimes you don't even need a radio uh, on your aircraft. That's as, as low down as it goes. You don't produce flight paths. You don't um, um, produce a flight log to say uh, what height you're going at or any of that because it's all uncontrolled airspace, hence the term. So you're asking for a crash? Um, that's something you'd have to take up with uh, Civil Aviation Authority because they control airspace. So what we control from a, a council perspective in terms of consents is the last 500 feet. 
So the last 500 feet from when you leave the control or the airspace into uh, a site where you land and when you take off again. So if we do require any information from a transponder point of view, it would only be from that control period, the 500 feet landing and taking off. So uh, overall, we looked at over 11,000 flights. Um, great. I say we, that's a royal we. Graham looked at 11,000 flights and went through all the details corresponding with the various uh, tracks that we found, looking back at the historical data. That's uh, quite intensive in terms of doing that. Um, we're also aware that there was, um, we, we were looking over a period where COVID was severely affecting a lot of the activity um, and was obviously gonna be uh, reflected in probably less flights, no tourists, etc. Um, so we also did snapshots of two week periods during this uh, uh, Christmas period and we did a two week snapshot of the previous uh, or th the one before we went into the first lockdown so we could just get some sort of a semblance of whether it's increasing etc and around that activity. Let's not do my next slide. Oh, sorry. I've, I've probably gone too far now with those two things. Oh, no. um, some of the points that were brought up earlier in relation to uh, the airways imagery that you saw in the report. The airways imagery was a 24-hour uh, imagery of all flight activity in and out of and around Waiheke Island. It wasn't what we've just seen on the screen, which is all activity that's gone on in that period of time. So that's why it looked very concentrated around Waiheke, because it was only looking at Waiheke. It wasn't looking at any flights going from Mechanics Bay to the North Shore, etc. So that's just to say why that looked like that and all the concentration, because that's all it was looking for. So that's where Airways did that. And it also, I believe, covered fixed wing aircraft. Um, there was also a comment in relation to um, the fact that we said that only 3% of flyovers went over Waiheke. Um, we didn't include landing and takeoff data on that because that's covered in a separate part of the report. That 3% was looking at a period of time when we looked at every single flight that went up and down from a helicopter point of view. We then put them into uh, a table and then we came up with those uh, points which might be um, 50 per cent over the North Shore, Howick was 25 per cent, CBD 7 per cent and Waiheke was 3 per cent. Uh, so that didn't include landing and takeoff, it's the, the period that they were travelling over those particular locations. So if you imagine when a helicopter is going from north to south, it comes, it, they mainly follow um, the main arterial road. So State Highway 1 is a big track that people follow. They get to controlled airspace near to the airport, so they do a wide berth and that's when they'll go over Howick, hence why Howick has a lot of activity going over it, because they want to avoid the airfield and the, and the controlled airspace. Um, and then they'll go further south. And that's why you, you get those changes. 7% CBD will probably be, be those that are around Mechanics Bay to and from around there. And, and, and then Waiheke, those are the trips that are going over Waiheke that may be coming from the Coromandel or going out to Great Barrier, etc. They won't be the ones that are landing there. So that's why there's a differential in some of those percentages. We accept that Waiheke is one of the primary destinations. It's a tourist destination. A lot of the wineries uh, have helicopters going in and out and, and helipads. Um, we found that non-compliance was primarily associated with aircraft types differing from those in the consent. Um, we've got about 11 consents where a particular aircraft will be mentioned, or it may say that aircraft or quieter. And what we found is that some of the fleets have been changed over the time. Some of those consents may, may go back 20 years and you probably wouldn't want to be going on a 20-year-old helicopter. They'll have been updated, so therefore there's, there's a change there. But it is only a handful in relation to that. Sometimes we found the odd aircraft that landed was a different type, but actually it was a quieter type, so it wouldn't have had any impact in relation to uh, the noise that it occurred. Um, but generally, in terms of those consent conditions, keeping of logs, um, number of flights, we found it was relatively, well, uh, across the board they were compliant. Some, some uh, particular uh, helipads would have only had one or two flights over a year long period, but they're allowed a lot more than that within their consent. Um, so that was sort of the, the general findings that we had. One of the other points was about complaints that was brought up. We've only had 
uh, I think 59 complaints in total over a three-year period relating to helicopters. Um, I appreciate that somebody said it's difficult to make those complaints, but looking at the level of complaints, they stretch from uh, crop spraying, they stretch from people landing and taking off from particular sites more than once. Um, and what that happens is we refer it back to the monitoring officer to check against the consent and then we follow up that way. Um, but in terms of reporting the complaint, there is a process within council, but I'm willing to go back uh, and examine that and to see whether we can improve that so people can better make those complaints and more relevant to their complaint. Um, so overall, that's, that's the report. I've simplified it in about 10 minutes and it's taken a year of Graham's life to compile this report. Um, just doing some of that analysis over that Christmas period. Um, it takes four hours to do 24 hours analysis. So trying to do a two week period, you times that by 14, and then you realize how long and how intensive it is to try and uh, do that analysis. And, and Graham's remained sane throughout that. Um, yeah, it's a matter of opinion. <laughs> he, did, he did have a pilot's license back in the day and has an interest in aviation. So hence why he was chosen to do this piece of work as well as his day job. So. Um, that's the end of our presentation. I'm willing to take uh, questions, Chair. Thank you very much. And thanks um, to you both. And it does show <clears throat> the breadth of uh, expertise we have in the Auckland Council organisation and the, uh, that it is complex and it's not just something that any of us could uh, do or get through. So we don't have questions, but I assume there are some. Uh, Councillor Turner. So just you can identify between commercial operations working for council, because all this stuff here is basically, this is all activity, not just private activity, correct? Through to yes, that's all activity. So can you differentiate between the purpose of these flights? I'd, I'd probably have to say no. Um, we have had somewhere we've checked and it was actually for repairing the for telephone masks, towers, yeah. radio masts, etc. Um, so we, we, we will be able to identify those, but most of the time it could be leisure, it could be commuting. Operate, uh, helicopter operations is huge with track carting all this material into the tracks, into the water care areas and uh, pulling things out of streams and stuff. It's really, really multiplying many time over. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, you tend to notice when aircraft are being used for a commercial purpose, like you say, because I don't remember going through the track and you could see one in Hobsonville where it was sitting over an area for sort of half an hour just doing small circles. I mean, we still, as part of that overall data, we still that record that as a takeoff and a landing wherever it came from, but the actual use of the helicopter is quite diff difficult to determine. That would have the most impact on the community present too. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Darby. Thanks, team. Thanks for doing this work. Much appreciated. Um, I'm sure it was quite laborious, crunching all those numbers. Yeah, but you're used to it. Um, hey, just, um, you reconciled the flight log data with the flight radar 24, uh, an app I only became aware of last year. Um, did you, f now we know that transponders can be turned off, and so flight radar 24 is not as reliable, but you're saying f the flight logs are reliable. How reliable are the, is the flight log data? Would you give it a 95 or is it a 100? Uh, through you, the Chair. Um, the, if you recall, I said we went to the heliport to try and get some of that data because we realised they were the main sources of the helicopters going to and from uh, the uh, Waiheke and the various locations. And that was just to capture some of that that may not have been given by the consent holders in their log details. Um, so it was just to, to, to marry that up. Um, and we didn't find that there was, uh, for instance, you know, twice as many in the logs from the heliports and only, uh, you know, half of them appeared in the logs from the actual consent holder. So that was just to make sure that we, we didn't have somebody that took off halfway across, turned off the transport, transponder and then landed on a particular helipad. And we found that they were consistent with the flight tracking that we, we looked at. Okay, so you're pretty confident you've got a pretty good grab of the a data here, but did you, did you notice um, aircraft showing up on Flight Radar 24 data coming through that didn't show up on the flight log data? Right, no, we... 
It, not particularly. Um, some of the flights, and I made reference to in the report, are quite difficult to track, when you're, particularly when you're looking over a 12-month period, because the way that air, uh, helicopters in New Zealand are registered, either using a H or an I suffix, mm. and I presume there's only a limited volume of registrations, and they get moved from aircraft. identifiers sometimes during that 12 month period change registration so when you're trying to go back and and look for them extremely hard to do mm. i mean some we managed to marry up but not not all of them okay i'm getting that you're pretty confident you've got a good data set here yeah. and there is situations chair where um there's blind spots so mm -hmm. you'll have blind spots at the far end of waiheke where there's hills some over on great barrier you have blind spots so you, you're sometimes looking at it and you see a helicopter disappear <laughs> It's not because they turned the transponder off, it's because they've probably gone into a blind spot. We had one on one aircraft that just kept blinking on and off and we're wondering what's going on. It had problems with its transponder, um, which was later fixed. So there is situations where the transponder won't show up if you looked above, but the vast majority of the time, and I've tested it out myself, sadly sitting at home when a helicopter goes overhead, I switch on ADSB exchange and I can see where that helicopter's come from and where it's going to. I haven't yet found one that hasn't got a transponder on, but I appreciate I'm not listening to them all day long. So second question, Chair, just if transponders are, are not required to be on by law when the helicopter is started its um, drive system up and then flying, what is the what is the point of the transponder? Is that just a voluntary safety? Devices. The, there's lots of different ways that aircraft can be tracked. There's primary, secondary radar, there's different... So those are the sort of old-fashioned ways of tracking aircraft. So this is a, a GPS, but it's still a hybrid-based system. So it uses a satellite to identify the location of the aircraft, and it beams that down to a ground station. That's why there's still some deficiencies in what you can see when they get lower, because it's still missing some data. So there are systems that are uh, commercial, which some operators buy into, which aren't public, which aren't CAA um, approved, for want of a better term, that track completely off satellites. So satellite signal down to the aircraft, get its location, sends it back up. But the ADSB system, which is what the Civil Aviation Authority are moving everyone to, I think you'll notice in the report I mentioned that all aircraft that fly in uh, restricted airspace has to have a transponder by the end of last year. So it's, a, it's now a legal requirement for to have it, but it isn't a legal requirement for them to have it turned on if they're in unrestricted airspace. Is there merit in us, um, if we were to be treating with CAA, to approach them and request that in the Auckland urban area? Or, or yep. To, I mean, ultimately, they control the airspace. On? Is there, yep. is, are you seeing an argument for us to be approaching them in that regard, seeking transponders on? I mean, that's an option for council, the yeah. conversation with CAA. I think one thing I just want to draw your attention to, I know that report's got a few complicated little pieces in it, but there is an airspace guide in there, the Civil Aviation Airspace Guide. And I think um, it's worth noting that unrestricted airspace, which Waiheke is, you don't even need a radio in an aircraft as long as you're flying in what they call VFR conditions, mm -hmm. which is visual flight rules, which is a day like today. You can quite happily bounce around Waiheke without even having a radio. So I think yeah. there's a misconception sometimes that you know everything out there is monitored by radar, and strictly that's not the case. Yeah. Final question, uh, Chair. Just on the overflight numbers, those percentages, 50% overflight. So that is not an aircraft uh, landing on the North Shore or landing in Howick. That is a um, an origin and a destination beyond the, the, those yeah. areas. So through the chair, what I. What I tried to do, when we originally started looking at this set of data, I thought, well, it's actually worth comparing how busy it is in these other areas as well. Because it became quite obvious, you see a flight take off and you see it track straight through the North Shore. So what I tried to do, and I think it might have caused a little bit of confusion, is put a via. So, you know, an aircraft can take off from Mechanics Bay and then flies via the North Shore. Because what I was trying to think of when I was doing it was the noise impact of that flight. Mm. So that's what that, that information is for, really. Interestingly, there isn't many overflights over Waiheke, but that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of flights to Waiheke. That's a separate set of right. data. That's what I was trying to get. Yeah. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor. And <clears throat> your uh, addition to the recommendations request the Civil Aviation Authority review the need for a, and a spatial extent of additional controlled airspace across the Auckland region will be added to 
my chair, Rex, but maybe in discussions we might want to add um, this for the next item. We might want to add something about transponders, I don't know, but yeah. Thank you. Um, another question, Councillor Lee. Yes, for, from, thank you very much. From, from the, it's very interesting, but from, from your presentation and uh, some of the slides, one um, indicating all those aircraft movements, um, some of them high enough to create <coughs> vapour trails, um, would get the impression that the people who we are responding to with this report and the public pressure and the media pressure, um, those concerns are a little bit exaggerated or overblown. That's what I'm picking up from this presentation. Is that your intention? Food Chair, absolutely not. We, we came into this with a, an open mind. Uh, we've come from departments that weren't looking at helicopters. We came from compliance departments and we were asked to look at the consents and the compliance with the consent conditions. So that's what we came into it. It evolved with further information people. And we actually liaised with um, uh, Quiet Skies Wahiki and all the relevant parties in relation to it. So we came in with a very open mind uh, and we didn't go in with the intention of trying to, you know, there were, you, we might've said we were looking for the smoking gun, but we, we, we went and tried to turn over every stone we could. We weren't asked to go and look at the heliports, but we realised the heliports could give us that extra information so we could have a complete report and we, we you know we could answer all the questions in relation to compliance so we did go into it with an okay. open mind you're kind of textualizing it but one could get the impression that's unconsciously a bit dismissive because um i don't think i've ever received a complaint from anyone in my long years in local government about aircraft several thousand feet up in the air but I've received many, many complaints about helicopters coming into land or, or taking off and disturbing the peace of, of people's homes, um, whether they're on a, a, a semi-rural situation on the Gulf Islands or indeed in um, um, suburbs in Auckland. I think, there's, uh, I think it's important that we get the message from the public um, and, and do not confuse a helicopter landing activities and takeoff activities with aircraft, normal civil, civil aviation aircraft flying high overhead, because people do not complain or are concerned about them. Um, they are concerned about helicopter, land, helicopter movements in their neighbourhoods. That's the difference. Through the Chair, if I can just respond to that. I, I appreciate that the overflight uh, information may have been misleading and, and it wasn't intentional to do that. The reason we included it was because it had been brought up during various discussions uh, when it was first put up as a resolution. But also to bear in mind that helicopters naturally fly at a low altitude. Um, because if you're taking off from Mechanics Bay and you're going to Waiheke Island, there's absolutely no point in wasting fuel going up to 3,000 feet then to come down and land on Waiheke. So you will naturally stay at a, at a height of less than 1,000 feet. So if you're going to land on Waiheke, you will travel at a certain height and you may go right across the other side of Waiheke and land at a heliport or helipad and then fly back across the same space. So those landing and those overflying will probably be at the same height. So it's just to give some perspective in relation to that, that you may perceive a helicopter is going to land on Waiheke if it flies over, but it would be at that height that they fly over anyway, and therefore it may be a misconception. This report balances both so we can see what is a flyover and what is an actual landing and takeoff, uh, and that's purely why it was given. Just coming back to the question of transponders being turned off, Actually, um, it's a bigger problem than one would, um, one would uh, su suspect. Um, and it seems to me relates to the income and status of people who use routinely helicopters that these people sometimes um, have security concerns you know, the helicopter is the average person doesn't get round routinely in a helicopter. Um, a certain class of society, international people perhaps, um, do, and those people live separately and have um, a different, if you like, way of life than the average person. The average person 
tend to be the complainants, the people who switch off transponders because they don't want their movements recognised or tracked, are not the average person. But they're the people who tend to own and use helicopters routinely. Yes, thank you, <coughs> thank you Councillor. Uh, Councillor Dalton, question? We're still on questions. Yeah, question. Thank you. Um, can you tell me, I know that you weren't doing the landing thing. Um, do you, uh, are they meant to have um, noise monitoring equipment on site as, far, as part of their <coughs> consent? No, they're not. The assessment would have been done when the consent was granted. So the assessment made on um, the approach, it would have been made against the type of helicopter, etc. So that would have been done prior to the consent being issued. There's no requirement to have a noise monitoring device on site to measure that noise. And the thing to say about that, that can be distorted in very many ways, depending on where the wind's blowing. It can be, whilst the flight path may be designated in the consent, uh, a pilot is totally at liberty to disregard that for safety reasons or high winds from a different direction, which makes it unsafe to land in the in the designated flight path in the consent. So they may approach from a different way and therefore the noise will be different. Um, uh, depending on the weight, if you've got a full load on a helicopter, it will make more noise than if it was just the pilot going in to pick up one person. So it, it will change depending on the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And last question from Mayor Brown. Uh, do you need a, a pad to land a helicopter? I don't think you do. You can just land it anywhere, can't you? What's the limitations? I mean, I've been out and fished on a, we landed on a rock and went fishing. And we, there was no <coughs> sign of a pad there. And I've seen people land in farms and things. Uh, through Chair, Your Worship, um, you can if you farms are an interesting one. If you're if you're out on a on on a farm and and it's a farming activity and it's connected, such as spraying crops, you can land them not necessarily with a consent. Um, you can land in an emergency uh, anywhere. There's n there's nothing to stop you doing that. You can land on a road, um, but. If it's on land that's controlled by various plans, such as our district plans or our uh, unitary plan, then you, no, you're not allowed to just land uh, anywhere. You'd have to abide by those specific rules. But it would depend where you were landing. Some plans would allow for it. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess last question from me, just on probably to do with Councillor Dalton's question, is what, and our local boards have brought it up, would there be any other tools that you could use under the current rules to help monitor or improve the compliance, um, especially around noise, right now, without changing? Um, Chair, it's difficult for me to, to say that at this moment. What I would say is it, it's quite uh, labour intensive to look at all the flights and all the activity from all the helipads. Uh, as we've shown with this, we've gone back and looked at a year in time and then we've looked over a two week periods. That's very labour intensive. And as you've seen from our report, we've not found widespread non-compliance. So if there was a reason to go out and look for more and monitor more, then there would be a suggestion that there was a lot of non-compliance going on out there. And we didn't find that as a result of the analysis we did. And we've got, I've put added, we'll be adding to the resolution for item 10 around making it easier on the website. Are there other ways that without putting a resolution and that you feel you can improve the ability for people to complain and understand? Is it just really noise that people can complain about? Primarily it's noise, but noise is not covered under the RMA in relation to noise nuisance covered by a helicopter landing and taking off, so it's specifically excluded, hence why in a consent they mention in relation to the approach and everything else to reduce that noise. Um, so. Um, in, in answer to your question, I don't believe there's anything more we could do other than more, perhaps having more information on our website around helicopter activity and explaining about that consenting process, which I'm willing to go away and look at. Thank you. And last, last question, Councillor Stewart. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> have you taken also into consideration the helicopters that are flying? We've got a lot of helicopters flying at the moment, day and night because of ram raiding that sort of thing, because over the Howick, over our way, and that's probably going over to Waiheke as well, all night, I hear them flying around all night, and I see them flying around during the day when I am home. Um, do you take into consideration that as well? 
please. Through the other chair, with the police helicopter and the Westpac helicopter, we haven't taken that. That's not, they're not on a consent on any of the islands or the area that we're looking at, and it's primarily that's for emergency purposes only, so we haven't looked at that. They do, they fly around, sort of, around, how I can, around the Waiheke area. And that's probably, probably the main... Whilst I appreciate they are, but it wasn't part of the scope that we were looking at. Thank you, Councillor. Right, um, we will briefly debate or vote on this, but thank you uh, both and the others who worked with you on this uh, huge body of work, and we appreciate it, so thank you. <coughs> um, could I please have a mover for the monitoring findings? Okay. Councillor Darby, oh. any seconder? Deputy Mayor, second. Right, is there any debate on this report, or we, we can wait to the next? No speaking? All right, all those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Right, we move straight to item 10, and I think we have Alison here. Um, Warren is coming forward. And Peter, if you just want to introduce yourselves and your roles, and then we can go into the presentation. I just want to switch in. Um, I'm Warren Clennan, Manager, um, North, Regional Northwestern Islands Planning. Um, and I have Peter Vari here, who is the team leader for the Northern and and um, Hauraki Gulf Islands area, and and we've got um, Alison Pye as well, who's one of our senior policy planners, who works in Peter's team, and who's largely written most of the report. Um, so I thought I would start by um, talking through some of the resolutions because I realise some of you may not have had time to look at all of them. Uh, you'll recall that there were two parts to the um, resolutions that the former planning committee made back in May last year. So one was this compliance. Um, you'll, you'll see there, um, note that the compliance and monitoring department has commenced a project to analyse the resource consent conditions, and that part you've just heard. Um, and, and they worked with civil aviation to, to get all the patterns and, and so on. The last part, F, is what we're here to talk about, which is once that investigation's complete, we prepare a report with an analysis of the results and an assessment of the options available to address helicopter activity in the Auckland region. So that's what this report is about. So what I'll do is just go through some of the options that we looked that we looked at, and then I'll look at um, and just reflect on the resolutions that each of the three local boards have provided. So if we go to the next one, please. Or do, do I? Right. Okay. So the first. The first option is really the one where we simply defer any further work on the um, um, on the helicopters until we get to our um, uh, the um, Auckland Unitary Plan review. So that would that would simply defer it, um, and we would we start that work for 2026. The second one is the early implementation of National Planning Standard 15. And, and that, this will have, this amendment would propose text changes to exclude the use of averaging. So it would remove the three-day rolling average, which is currently in the Hauraki Golf District Plan, and make that one day. And that measurement of noise is similar to what happens already in the Auckland Unitary Plan. So that, that um, option can be um, implemented without any consultation. It's simply a, a, a national policy um, or national planning standard 
and it's not open to challenge. We wouldn't go through the submissions or appeals, um, and in fact we must not go through the normal um, Schedule 1 process. The advantage of that one also is that it would have the effect of increasing the setback um, distance um, to the nominal boundary, which is the, the distance that we use. And that would um, increase that by around 50 metres, so where you often get around, so we at the moment the three day one averages to about the 50, 50 metre um, limit, then this would move that out to 100 metres. The third option there is the plan modification to the Hauraki Gulf Islands plan, bringing in and in introducing to the to the um, helicopter rules the um, um, ability to um, delete the act. The, sorry, it would involve a plan change process. It would delete the restricted discretionary activity status, and it would replace it with a non-complying one in residential zones and discretionary in, in um, non-residential areas. In total, that would align more with the um, unitary plan, which has got a non-complying um, activity status in residential zones. So, and so that's a sort of a, a full review of, of that, which would mean that resource consents could be considered with all of the effects. Option four is um, the last one, and that's really around introducing a, pro a prohibited activity status for helicopter activity in residential zones, both in the Hauraki Gulf Islands and in the unitary plan, to change the activity status of restricted discretionary activities to become discretionary activities. Now that would involve two separate plan changes because they're at the moment two separate plans. Um, and, um, and, and so that would be, um, prohibition is a very difficult, very high bar to, um, to be able to justify um, without changing the entire policy framework in each plan. And for example, in the um, Hauraki Gulf Islands plan, it was written at a time when economic development was very important to many of the residents. And so there is a presumption around the promotion of tourism within a number of objectives and policies in that plan. And to go from there to prohibition, you have to do quite a lot of work there. Clearly it would be, um, I mean, you're trying to justify a blanket prohibition. So it's very difficult to be able to do that. So those are the four ones that we've evaluated. Um, next one, please. So what I thought I'd do next is to just talk about number two. Oh, sorry, that's me, is it? Me to click it? Hmm. Oh, just the ordinary. So the recommend recommended option is number two, which will amend the um, in NPS 15 to include that within the Hauraki Gulf Islands plan. It tightens the noise rules and will make it harder for applications in the Hauraki Gulf plan to meet the noise standards necessary to still qualify as a restricted discretionary activity. So it's more likely that there will be more, more um, discretionary, more applications which fit into the discretionary one, and that is unrestricted in the way that you can um, assess the effects there. Um, so I think I've gone through the rest of that. It, it aligns or much more closely aligns the Hauraki Gulf Islands plan with the unitary plan. Um, and as I've said, technically it's a, it's a change which 
allows fast implementation cannot be challenged. It, it involves a short report and it, and it involves a, um, a public notice. So it would, it would be able to improve the Hurricane Gulf Islands plan pretty quickly. Um, next one, please. Oh, me. That's right. <laughs> um, so I just thought I'd look at the three local boards and the um, resolutions that they've passed over the last few days, um, last week as well. So the Waitamata local board um, supported option two um, for the reason that it would manage noise effects in line with the national standards. It did have some concerns about um, how to give feedback, um, and I think that's going to be discussed as well. Um, and they wanted to make sure that resource consents in residential areas are publicly notified, and, and that happens now with the unitary plan. Um, they made some recommendations about shorter consent um, um, time periods, and that really has to be looked at on a case-by-case case basis. Um, they gave support to the Hariki Gulf, to the Waiheke and Aotearoa uh, local boards, and that they, they made the comment that the proliferation of helipads is a concern there. Um, they also wanted to cap the number of um, helicopter movements, and they um, and they wanted a proactive compliance plan um, for consents, noting that consent holders do um, uh, contribute towards, or can, can be asked to contribute at uh, the expense of that monitoring. Um, and they wanted a further review of rules to take place at the next AUP, which is also part of our recommendation. Um, they wanted a location for a commercial helipad service, servicing west, the western part of the city, um, and and I guess that's not part of what the council would do, but that's something that they wanted to see. Um, and then they really um, noted an overall harmful effect uh, that they saw on on particularly on residents' quality of life, and recommended also that transport transponders be turned on for takeoff and landing as well. Um, next one, Waiheke. Well, you heard pretty much from the local board this morning, but I'll just go through their um, uh, their recommendations quickly. So um, they made the point that. This is less of a compliance issue and more of a plan matter. So that's why we're looking at these options. Um, they We also had Quiet Sky, Waiheke this morning, talking to their um, report, and, and the chair of the local board also mentioned that, and you have that attachment with you. Um, so they um, wanted to um, approve option two being introduced with urgency, but option three being implemented as well. So um, so it's really both of those options, and option two should not be delayed by the implementation of, of um, option three. Well, option two is fairly, fairly quick. Um, they also um, were frustrated about the um, processes around delaying the implementation of the nation, national planning standard. Um, and I guess I would say, say to that, that until, until very recently, when we were looking at those planning standards, we were looking at the bundle of them together, um, which covers a whole range of items around topics such as new zones to go in the plan, um, a, a series of new definitions, a whole range of things which really would 
be most served if it was all done at one review time. And it wasn't, and it wasn't until just recently we realised that the noise one we could, we could actually separate out and simply work on that one. And so that's why option two um, recommends that early adoption of that. Um, they were also concerned about the protection of the um, vulnerable wildlife, <coughs> excuse me, and, and that's been discussed earlier this morning. And, and they've all, they also uh, raised some concerns with the um, report that's been done, um, and, and I think that's been talked through with the um, um, compliance guys beforehand. Um, and you have that full report. Um, so the next, oh, I think they continue on there. The, um, they also want us to work there with um, CAA to, to just, uh, find out more information around the un, unrecorded helipads. And they were concerned about um, the analysis on complaints and thought that we should also add in the um, petition which was presented to the council um, back in December of 21, I think it was. Um, and they've also talked about the, uh, they, they, as I talked about before, the opportunity to um, implement NPS 15 earlier. Um, so that was that was that one. The last one was Aotea, um, whose, um, whose comments were or resolutions we got last night. Um, they, were, they had particular mana whenua concerns um, and they felt that some of the applications um, had seemed to have little consideration for their intrinsic values. They were really noting that the island was a quiet sanctuary, and most of their comments around high conservation values, um, so which would give neg which would negatively impact local biodiversity, and so on. Um, they supported the immediate implementation of option two, but then they also went on to. Um, identify that that's an interim step and their support was for option four, which is introducing the prohib prohibited activity for helicopter activity in residential zones in both the Hauraki Gulf Islands plan and in the um, unitary plan. Um, and they also saw that there was a need to give greater consideration to the they meant the New Zealand Coastal Policy State. They think that there are now enough, um, enough, uh, the, the, the capacity now for airfields and helicopter pads are pretty full and request that we work with regulators to develop clear flight corridors across and around Aotea Great Barrier and, and that's something that is really the um, responsibility of the um, civil aviation. So those are the options and those are the, um, um, so you've got the options and you've seen the um, responses from the three local boards. Um, I also wanted to just touch on the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement um, because there's clearly some debate between us and the um, Waiheke, oh, the Quiet Skies Waiheke people. We think that the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement does cover the coastal environment of the Hauraki Gulf and Islands Plan. And, and um, it's done in a, in, in a special way here for this. Section 7 and 8 of the Hauraki Gulf Marine Park Act uh, recognises the national significance of the Hauraki Gulf um, and, and also the management of the Gulf itself. And for the section, that's section seven and eight, and 
Section 10 says that for the coastal environment, Sections 7 and 8 must be treated as a New Zealand coastal policy statement issued under the, the Resource Management Act. So we think that's a reasonably clear interpretation, um, and, um, and I thought we needed to make that clarification after the discussion um, that was had this morning. Um, so that's the presentation. Peter, did you want to add anything? I think we're probably, we've, that's a huge amount of information and we thank you and um, I think, I hope everyone's read the, um, all the attachments and all the options in the full report. So we might just go to questions if that's okay and then see what we might pull out of there if there are, because uh, we have four already. Um, Councillor Sayers? Yeah, thanks Chair. Uh, thanks Warren. Um, if it moves to this discretionary or even uh, discretionary, so, so the first options, uh, was it two and three? Um, do, can you just explain how that affects the full notification? I think you mentioned it does go out for, for notification now, but there seems to be a, uh, some of the feedback from the local borders for full notification. So how do those, can you just clarify how that full notification process um, operates now and if that increases the, the likelihood of it? So yes, so currently under the Harrogate Gulf Islands plan, um, helicopter basically the helicopter activity, a helipad is a restricted discretionary activity. So, um, and with that with that status comes the ability for it to be non-notified. If if it was changed to uh, full discretionary via option three, not option two, but option three, then. Um, the, the standard provisions about notification under the RMA would apply. It also means that with uh, restricted discretionary activity status, the, the range of things that you can consider when you consider a resource consent, at the moment they're limited to um, noise effects and um, noise effects and the visual effects of earthworks and so on of a, of a helipad. So when it was discretionary, you would have a, you could consider a whole range of things that were available. So you could con consider explicitly a whole whole everything basically. So that's that's the difference. And um, I know we have um, someone from our consents team here. If um, Brad Allen is is here, did you want to add anything to that, Brad? Um, just to yeah. You just want to introduce yourself, Brad. Sure. Kia ora, I'm Brad Allen. I'm the Resource Consents Team Leader for the Harry Gulf Islands area. Um, yeah, so Peter has basically outlined the, the two aspects. With the restricted discretionary activity status, there's a non-notification rule, which means that we can only notify it if there's a special circumstance applicable to that consent itself. Um, and it also narrows the matters of discretion that we can look at with the Resource Consent Assessment. So switching it to discretionary, would drop away with that non-notification preclusion, so it would be open for notification, provided that it meets the test of the RMA for notification in terms of the effect level, um, and then you'd also have unfettered matters of discretion to look at. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you for that. So, just a lead-on question from my chair, just a quick one. So, that does that automatically meet full notification or just notification, so i.e. limited, or does it full and also? Um, Peter, just pick up on your point where other things can be included in there. We had a presentation about the island, you know, and the, and the bird life on the island. All those things could be uh, included. <coughs> yep. Just just clarification on those. Yeah. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, yes, so all matters will be able to be considered because your discretion is only limited when you're restricted discretion, which is what most of them can make their application fit into. Um, so you wouldn't have any, any limits on that discretion. You can consider any effect. Um, sorry, can you remind me? Uh, yeah, so in terms of notification, as I mentioned before, it, at the moment there is a specific rule that says non-notified if you're in the ID space. Um, going into discretionary, that rule falls away and doesn't apply, and then you're, you're then subject to your normal RMA tests in terms of it has to be at least a minor effect on persons to notify persons, so limited notification. 
and it has to be a, a minor or more than minor effect on the environment before you can publicly notify. So it brings in the ability for it, it's still case by case in terms of what the effects are. Thank you. Good questions, Greg. But just to confirm, Brad, that that all would require the plan change to allow those things to happen. We can't change that. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Walker. Questions answered. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for your uh, quite detailed paper. Look, I've got three questions, potentially four, depending on your answers. So I note that you went for option two as staff recommendation. Can you confirm that adopting option two, that that will have no impact on the ability for emergency service helicopters or police hel helicopters to operate when they need to? Yes, so for example, in, in both the unit, Auckland Unitary Plan and in the Haraki Gulf Islands Plan as a, as a permitted activity, emergency services and, and so on uh, um, are listed as a permitted activity so they can continue. Changing that noise, the, removing the averaging provision won't affect them at all. Thank you. Um, I just want a clarification point on paragraph 19. So that says there'll be no impact on helicopter activity for existing helipad consent holders. If we adopt option two around noise standards, does that only apply to new consent applications? Yes, yes, and this is some sort of review clause in the uh, uh, granted consents, but yes. Okay, that, thank that, you. That we, mm. Now, looking at all options, um, Emphasis is placed on the mitigation uh, around the negative social impacts of helicopter noise, although the compliance report doesn't suggest there is a particular problem at this time. So my question is, has there been any assessment of the positive economic benefits of helicopter activity? Not at this stage, but the again, if we look at the objectives and policies that, was, that were behind the rules in the Haraki Gulf Islands plan in particular, they, they absolutely recognise that there is a, a benefit. Uh, so, uh, um, for example, the, the rules around helipads and so on um, acknowledge the Gulf Islands are a popular tourist destination and that air travel to, from and around the Gulf Islands is a recognised component of the tourist industry. And so that that, has, that objective has driven the, the uh, status, the restricted discretionary activity status, uh, through because they're, they're seeing the benefits of helicopter activity to the tourism sector. So supplementary, if I may, may, Mr Chair, please. So therefore, if you went for option A, would this be done, would this work be done for the review of the unitary plan so that we could consider all the positive and the negative impacts of helicopter activity? and not just half the story. Option A was leaving it to the unitary plan. Option one. Sorry, option one, sorry, one, A, one. Third one. Um, so sorry, what was the question again? So what, what we've got, everyone's been talking about the, um, the negative social impacts of noise, but actually, no one's looked at the positive economic benefits necessarily. So if we went for option one, would both the positives and the negatives be reviewed as part of the unitary plan yeah, review? Yeah, yes, that's correct. That's, that's correct. Um, at any plan making stage, we would, um, apart from option two, which is just the standard one, but for one, three and four, we would have to carry out significant um, consultation with all sectors of the community um, and it would all be publicly notified, the normal process. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And just before I go to you, Councillor Darby, now that I'll just move what is up there and I think Councillor Darby's emailed to say he'd like to support or second what is there and we will just continue with questions. Uh, Councillor Darby. Thanks, Chair. And, uh, Warren, thank you. Thanks for the phone explanations that you've given Warren, Peter and Alison. Um, just in terms of um, the prohibited status, Warren, um, you mentioned it's a high bar to, uh, to, to win, because you've got to think about the process and the evidence to get to the end of your 
your um, plan change to um, lock it in. Um, and there may be counter evidence. You, you said it's a high bar. How have you arrived at it being a high bar? Is there case law? Um, I think you did mention it to me prior, and maybe even this report, which I haven't found. But is that informed by um, your planning response and a legal response? Yes, uh, yes, exactly. Okay. Yes, it is, it is both. Okay, just going to the plan change, um, we mentioned there that we have to commence the, the AUP plan change in 26. That's the commencement date, isn't it? Um, that's not the date we're notifying it. So, and that could be three, could, could be as many as three years on before we have a landing point, you know, because, you know, it's subject to appeal, so it could be operative in part. Would it be reasonable to say we could be looking at 2029 before a plan change might be through? Yeah, I think I think your your timing is is right. It could be that, but the point I guess we're making with this with this, our recommendation here to do option two is that it's an interim step, and we always know that we are going to have to review the whole range of helicopter uh, provisions when we do the unitary plan anyway. So so if we did op we go for option two, we're putting we're, we're changing things so that the averaging of the noise levels in the Harrogate Gulf Islands plan is taken out and we know that three years or whatever the number of years down the track we'll be doing the full uh, review of all the provisions. So so by doing option two now we're not foregoing doing option three uh, when we do the, uh, the uh, amendment of the Auckland Unitary Plan and bringing the Harrogate Gulf Islands fully within the scope of that plan. So. Chair, just um, pursuing that, so it's more like it, it's a pragmatic approach, to, you're saying, to do it through the, the full review. It's not one that's driven by uh, a cost? It, for, well, if, for example, if we, look, if we went into a, a, one thing that could happen is if we went into a full a, a plan change for option with option three now, given the length of time, two, three years before it could actually, with appeals, because we know the provisions that are in the Haraki Gulf Islands plan at the moment came through an appeal process. It's likely that anything we do with new helicopter provisions could also go through that process. That could take a number of years. And so what we would end up with is, if we did a plan change now, that might take three years, the cost of appeals and planning process, not for just for us, but for the wider community who wanted to be involved in that. And then, at the same time, near the end of that process, we'd be embarking again on the full unitary plan okay. review. Okay. So we would almost, we could even overlap. And that's a big burden for us as the ratepayers and a big burden for the community as well. Okay, look, come to the, uh, I think it's the final question, Chair, if I may. And it is the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement and um, referring to that, Warren, you, you spoke a few words around about around that. About three years ago, I took an interest in an application, a helipad application at Paradise Drive, and uh, I looked at the report and I read it in quite a lot of detail, and it shocked me, actually, that there was no reference to an, an SEA, a special ecological area, isn't it, uh, that abuts Paradise Drive on the coastal side. Uh, it wasn't to be seen, and it was like uh, the the even our own planning staff, and no criticism of them now, it's historic, had, they, they gave no notion of thought to the proximity of an SEA, which had to be travelled over at low altitude to land uh, on the helipad as proposed, because we know helicopters just don't come down from a thousand feet. Um, so going to that national col uh, coastal policy statement, can, can you just take us through that again? Because it is quite technical. I think what we're looking for, uh, well, the communities are looking for, is that the National Co Coastal Policy Statement is being given effect to absolutely. Um, 
and um, and that all of those uh, ecological um, impacts uh, can be considered. Can you just you might have to just go over that again, please, Warren. Yeah. Um, so I don't know the the details of the consent application, and perhaps Brad would be able to talk to that. Um, I guess the key thing is that we consider that the um, Hauraki Gulf um, Marine Park Act um, has, has several sections in it which relate to section 7 and 8 which relate to protection of all of these various environments and then section 10 ties it together to say that these sections form part of the um, uh, New Zealand, uh, should be considered as a New Zealand coastal policy statement. Now that's, that's in the HGI plan. You would have been looking at uh, a resource consent under the Auckland Unitary Plan or before that? Uh, it was under the AUP, yeah. So, so that's separate and as far as I'm aware, that means that the normal NZCPS would have been considered. Is that not right, Brad? Yeah, through the chair. Um, I think I'm aware of the one. The, the Paratai Drive consent was for a noise testing ahead of a potential application that was going to come in. So it wasn't to establish, a, yeah. So it wasn't to establish the pad itself. It was to look at getting some noise measurements to then see if they were going to prove well, pursue an actual application. Um, I haven't actually looked at that decision, so I haven't actually looked at the coverage of the Coastal Policy Statement or the SEA, but I can have a look if that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, I don't want to go into that application. All I'm wanting some assurance on, and our communities are wanting some assurance that those ecological effects are, are really comprehensively canvassed. And you're saying that in applications that are coming in now, they are. Thing, through the chair for for the orc ones like that one that should have it should have been something that was canvas it may have been um, at the lower end of the scale given that it was for testing and not for the the permanent establishment but it is an aspect that should have been within the scope at least of it yeah next year i'll leave it there for now thank you uh councillor lee yes um in regard to option two compliance with the National Planning Standard of 2019. Is that really an option? <laughs> um, you know, we've talked about, was it a, a reasonably high compliance with the helicopter activity? Um, but what about our compliance? Are you giving that, you're giving compliance with a, 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 a national planning standard as some sort of an option um, for people to support. That's something that should be done as a matter of duty. It's, yeah. So, so we, we recognise when the national planning standards, uh, when, they, when they've come out, they've, they have a time frame for implementation. And what we're talking about is rather than implementing, because there are, they, they require significant changes to the plan. So for example, the zone, all the names of the zones and the, the range of zones, the definitions in a plan and so on would have to be changed under the national planning standards. That's what the government wants to happen across New Zealand. What, what we're saying is, and they, we were given a time frame to do it, what we're saying is we, we can, we think we can pick out this one part which is addressing the concern about noise, and we can do that early. Rather than doing the comprehensive change, which we're required to do, you're right, it's a requirement, but we're, we're doing this early, and um, we, we think that that is still an option to do it early, rather than waiting, because we still have time under the government's time frame that we're required to do this, we still have time, so the option is do it early rather than waiting and doing it as part of the comprehensive change which we would be required to do further on down the track. 
Uh, can I just get confirm this this uh, national planning uh, standard came out in 2019, did it not? And you think doing it now is kind of doing it early? Uh, really? Is that best practice? The government is, for example, for the unitary plan has given us 10 years, so we would be doing it in 2029. So it, they, have, they have long, long time frames in the implementation. So we're saying we, an option in the interim is to do it earlier than we would have normally had to do it, which addresses the noise concern raised in the Hauraki Gulf Islands plan, and then we do everything else in a comprehensive way when we do the unitary plan review and bring the islands within it, within the, uh, the unitary plan fully. Through the Chair, if I could just add, um, we do think it actually is an option to bring it early. The package we're talking about with the National Planning Standards is huge and wide-ranging, and what we're doing is picking this one out alone, knowing that we're going to have to do something by 2029. Uh, it's entirely... Um, normal for us to have to prioritise some of this stuff and that is partly why uh, the, uh, when government makes legislative changes, uh, and I'm, I know that you know all of this, but when they make changes it usually takes a long time, it often takes a public process, public notification process to go through, therefore it's not something we can just switch on and switch off immediately. So uh, this particular part doesn't require public notification, it just gets slotted in. It's a national planning standard, it's just what happens. It's therefore quick, we've pulled it out. There's a whole lot more work that we will have to do leading up to 2029, plus we have a review of the unitary plan, plus of course we've got all of the current government reform legislation uh, and requirements that they're asking us to do over the next few years. So as much as we would love to be able to have all of the resources to be able to do everything immediately, it just doesn't happen that way. So. Uh, that is why it is a matter of prioritisation and why we are suggesting it's an option in this case. Can, can I just ask um, you, Ms Tyler, how many plan changes is this council, has this council dealt with and is dealing with since the, um, the establishment of the uh, Auckland Unitary Plan? What number are we up to now? We've, we can talk about 78, but it's higher than that, isn't it? Yes, it probably will be. I know we certainly, so if we just, because we're including private plan changes in that as well, mm. aren't we, Warren? So maybe yeah, you've got some numbers. Yeah, there would be quite a few private plan changes, but I imagine what, what, what the number, number is would it be now? Appro approaching 90. About Sorry? 91, I think, 90? 90. 91. Yeah. And that's, uh, when did that plan go? 2013. That's quite a bunch of plan changes every year that we must be budgeted for. Is that correct? So, so many of these are private plan changes. I mean, or, uh, for which we we recover we costs, um, and you can have large plan changes and small plan changes. I remember one of the earliest plan changes I did within this new council was a plan change to protect one tree. Mm. Right, that was not exactly a large plan change. We're talking about a plan change to manage helicopter effects being a significant plan change going right through the whole gamut. And I'll just, okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll keep it quick. Can I, can I just ask you one more thing? Did I, was I mistaken when I heard you say, Mr McLennan, that the um, uh, applications, helicopter, helipad applications under the AUP uh, are notified? Did I hear that? They yeah. aren't. No, no, well. Because because they have a different status, the the as there's no automatic non notification clause as they are on the in the Hauraki Gulf Islands. So they go through the normal tests under the RMA to determine whether or not they should be notified or limited notified. What, 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 there's two types of notification. Is there not? There's limited notification whereby. Um, the applicant talks to the neighbours, next door neighbours, um, and then there's ones that are publicly notified. So how many helipad applications under the AUP have been publicly notified? Because the impression has been given is that's the norm, and we know that it's not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in terms of 
AUP consents, most of the ones down in Westmere and the, probably the main central ones, they're all actually legacy consents pre-AUP. Um, there have been a couple recently ones for a variation which was limited notified. Well, it was determined for limited notification, the applicant withdrew that and elected to publicly notify. Um, 130 submissions and then they withdrew their application. Uh, there was another one that was put through, uh, which was the science field, I believe it was, which was on a non-notified basis, but that was challenged under judicial review and overturned. So there haven't been any, there haven't been any granted under the the new AUP rules in terms of that that Westmere area. So public notification rather than limited notification is not the norm under the AUP non-complying, is that correct? Uh, it, it's dependent on the, the application itself. Just, and the but just a little bit, the, the impression was given inadvertently that um, under the AUP, um, helipad applications are publicly notified and they are not, unfortunately, and they should be. All right, thank you. And, and keep in mind on when we're talking budget to do things, we've reduced the budgets over the last number of years while increasing the amount of work and the government has a lot to um, answer for, especially Plan Change 78 and huge amount of reform. So the last three years on top of the pandemic, the planning team have been doing far more with fewer resources. So we just need to keep that in mind. Deputy Chair, um, Angela Dalton, Councillor Dalton. Thank you. I uh, just want to clarify something for my own mind, um, Brad, I think it's a question for you. I think it was Quiet Sky that said that um, under the RMA, <coughs> the NZP, NZCPS has not been applied in the Hauraki Gulf Island area um, in terms of coastal wildlife uh, when doing consenting. Is that correct? Thanks for the chair. Um, the current settings of the plan are that it's restricted discretion, so it puts restrictions on, and that restricts us on high policy documents as well. So we've got the umbrellas of noise, we've got the umbrellas of if there's a physical earthworks or a structure associated with establishing the helipad, um, and it comes within those umbrellas, then yes. Outside of that at the moment, for a restricted discretionary one, we will be restricted on it. Gosh, so the, so the environment is not considered the coastal bird life, wildlife, nothing? Okay, thank you. Um, Megan, uh, my second question, last question. Um, to give confidence to um, Waiheke, uh, particularly the local board, um, under option uh, C, under C, notwithstanding D, saying we've got no money, is it possible to begin pre-work? Um, as part, is it possible to begin some work as part of the pre-work of the AUP? Thank you. Uh, through the Chair, uh, yes, of course it's possible. Uh, the question will come, of course, as to priorities of work programme. Uh, we, we don't have the resources at the moment to just start some work or take it kind of slow for a few years. Uh, we would need to to get instructions from you to say, look, this is a priority to do this, and therefore we'd have to advise what other things are going to drop off or get deferred or somehow get slowed down. In reality, I think if um, if we do this work, you just want to get it done, as opposed to eke it out and do it in little bits. Um, and it really just comes to prioritisation. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Councillor. And I have asked, there is no in the next financial year from July 1, there is no budget at all to reprioritise for this work. So there isn't actually a choice even if we said today, hey, reprioritise, there isn't. And the only option we would have is to get this prioritised through governing body through the 10-year budget. So that I've got that in the background, but that would be a discussion for all of us to have that we can't make that decision here when we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. But, but it is budgeted as a part of the omnibus changes to the unitary plan, but that's obviously later. Um, Member Ashby. Kia ora. Uh, thank you for the report. Uh, just a couple of questions from me. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, this first one has two, two components, but really it's um, how has uh, 
a Tiao Māori lens, I guess, being a, a applied to your analysis in terms of the options. So not 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 talking about weekly lists and things like that, but I guess the views of um, of mana whenua, notably, um, and I'll break this into two questions, um, uh, Nga Te Rehua, uh, and a part of this is uh, related to, we've talked about the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. Um, policy two of that, Clause E, talks about taking into account iwi management plans when you're making changes and thinking about activities in the coastal environment. Um, and I just note Nga Te Rehua's iwi management plan has a page on inappropriate use of airspace. So have you taken that into the... Is that reflected in your analysis? I haven't seen it in the report, but is that... Um, were you aware of that? And did you take that into your thinking? Then the second part of that question is, um, in regard to Waiheke, have you sought the views of... or Have you um, collated previous uh, views of Ngāti Pāwa, for example, in relation to... To this sort of thing. Um, thanks for the question. Um, yes, um, certainly Ngati Rehua were um, pretty strong in the previous report. So that was that May May 22 report. Um, they were pretty strong in their opposition to resource consents being granted um, along the. Um, Midlands Beach area, not far from an Urupa, and and so on. And um, as we did that report, I remember looking right back to the um, um, cultural. What was the one that Nicola did? Uh, the environmental plan. Yeah, the, the Ngati Rehua environmental plan that we looked at, that certainly set out a whole range of places where, um, where they were particularly keen to preserve peace and quiet and amenity and, and so on. So, and, and that's come through even in the resolution from the local board today. Um, in terms of Ngaitaiki Tamaki and Ngati Poa Iwi Trust, we haven't discussed this report with them specifically because we know that once we do a, a plan change there will be a whole lot of consultation but through the um, area plan work that we did um, we certainly got some strong views from each of them around the importance of quiet and amenity to some of these significant places. Thank you. And through the chair, just one, one final question. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, option two has a very narrow scope, and I understand um, that makes that makes it, uh, I guess, a, a easier win than the other options. But um, it would be fair to say um, there's no scope. You talked earlier about um, there's little scope for, uh, in terms of helicopters, for under the matters of discretion for mana whenua values, it's quite limited. Am I I'm correct? Yeah. Um, and so under that option, there's, n there's no further scope to increase those mana whenua values as, as matters of discretion because it's, it's, it's very technical. Um, so I guess the, the, question I'm, uh, the question I have is, um, g given the first part of my question around coastal policy statement and the views of iwi, which are clearly going in one direction, which we've heard about, today um, and the limited scope of, op well, no scope under option two to improve that, um, would it be fair to say that option three or four would be the better options in terms of compliance with the desires of, of the relevant mana whenua? I'm assuming the answer is yes, but um, take your advice. Yes, yes, I think, I think you're, you're correct that option three gives much more ability to consider a much wider range of things. And therefore, for op option three, it's really a timing thing as to when we do that, that larger plan change. But the, there is an advantage in option two, the narrowly focused one, in that um, in order for it to remain, for uh, an application to remain 
um, restricted discretionary, it's either going to have fewer flights or in, because there is a wider boundary to get to. So it could tip a number of consent applications into the discretionary basket anyway. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Member Ashby. Um, last question, Councillor Ferry. Sorry. Oh, sorry, and Councillor Philippine. Uh, kia ora. Um, so, I've just been trying to get my head around a couple of aspects of it. Um, and I guess, first up, I'm gonna, gonna ask along the lines of um, Councillor Dalton's questions and in, in the answers from, from uh, Megan and, and Richard about the um, prioritisation issue. So um, is it an option uh, to say at this point, if there is something that needs to be delayed, this would go up the list in terms of, you know, being a project that we would look at to slot in if something was delayed? Can we do that? Through the Chair, just, just in thinking about it, um, there's an opportunity coming up, of course, uh, through the long-term plan, not organisation sense for the council, obviously, across everything that it does. That could that could be um, a way of of doing that prioritisation and saying, yep, put this one to the top, and then we can advise you, well, and these things are going to drop off the bottom, or you know, it would be deferred at the bottom. So uh, it's it's it is it is absolutely an option. What I can't what I can't do for you right now is start the work tomorrow. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. That could be the process by which you could have this conversation if this is what you as a as a group want to do. Okay, um, that that presupposes though that we're shutting the door on any work on this in the next financial year because we won't sign off that LTP until the end of the next financial year. Yeah, that's right. So yes, yeah, so the long term plan would be you know 30 June 2024 would be yeah. signed up you know for that that yeah. next um, yeah. 24 25 year. Um, if you're wanting something you know within the next uh, 12 months, then we would have to advise you as, as to whether we can drop anything off. The work that we're doing at the moment in this particular area is is focused very much on the government reforms, as you're aware. Um, yeah. And so there's, I, I'm not, I don't think there's really any ability for us to change that unless, again, there was a whole bunch of money or resources that came in, which is yeah. not, not something that you probably have an opportunity to think about, certainly not this side of, of the budget yeah, conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, totally understand that, and I, I was more meaning to say if for some reason there was a delay with a piece of work, which meant that there was some capacity that came up in the next financial year. It could, year. Do, could. Okay. Yeah. I'm not aware of what that could be, but it could happen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Because um, that does happen from time to time, not very often, unfortunately. Um, the other question I have, which is probably more for um, the table over there, is in regard to the Hauraki Gulf Islands plan. So... In the report on page uh, para 75, it says that um, there was a review done in 2016, but I couldn't find, I could find one that was done in 2006, but I couldn't find one from 2016. So is that a typo? It just seems to me that, that that's quite an important thing for, for us to understand that it's actually been 17 years and not seven years. And I'm just thinking about how much has changed in that time period, particularly in relation to Waiheke becoming a, a place that has almost two communities living on it, the people who come and go a lot and the people who live there all the time. And there's quite a big difference between those two communities. We've also changed our views a lot around environmental protection over that time as well. So. I just wanted to, to check about that because I think that does have a bearing. Yeah, that, that, that is a typo, that one. It is 2012-13, um, which was the review of the HDI plan. Okay, so sorry, what, what year was the review? Started in 20... No, I'm started... <laughs> I don't know, Megan, when was it? The, the current one... Um, 2006, I think it became operative, didn't it? So it's in the early 2000s. Yeah, okay. So Mid 2000s, yeah. I, I guess just when we're thinking about the prioritisation and timing of this, um, that's a salient fact for me, is it's, it's not like we just did this. So, yeah, okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that, thanks. And can I just clarify, so the, 
the current provisions were, as I said before, uh, part of a, a consent order, Environment Court consent order in 2012, and then the plan was made partially operative in 2013. Where did 2016 come from? I think the thing was it's, it might have started in 2006. It was a long time in gestation to get to the, the final right. uh, version of two, in 2013. Okay, that's still over a decade. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And yeah, I have <coughs> asked the around the funding and we have over the term since the 2021 10-year budget um, kind of overexerted the staff of what they can reprioritise now and in with, as my understanding is, within the next year there is no ability to reprioritise anything unless we take it to finance. So my thought was maybe through the 10-year budget. Um, Councillor Philippine. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I just want to cover off the current rules that apply to um, the mainland, and excuse me for using that, and, and not our two respective islands. Um, currently around those, um, is there a, the ability, well, hold on, under the, the process available, the applicant has to take into account wahitapu? here currently and what is the situation in regards to Waiheke and Aotea? Thank you, through the Chair. Um, at the moment the unitary plans so of mainland uh, consents are unrestricted in terms of what they look at so if there's a relevant effect they need to address it so yes it should be taken into account. In terms of the Haraka Gulf Islands um, there's, as Warren said, there's two activities that you can be. You can be restricted discretionary if you meet a noise clause and you're the only one, as the only helipad on the site, you're, you'll be an RD consent. And that restricts our discretion to just the noise and physical, what well, visual effects of physical change. Um, if you don't meet those, then you're a discretionary activity and, and it should be considered in terms of all matters that are relevant. Right, and under option three, that could have made it possible uh, to take into account on the two, on Waiheke and Great Barrier Aotea, um, we could have had the ability to take into account um, Wahitapu and Mana Whenua Views. Thank you, through the chair. That's correct. If we are changing... So option three is changing the activity statuses and that takes it away from that discretion. So it would open it up. So the discretionary and the non-complying would both have the scope to go there um, if that policy shift was made. Okay, Chair, so um, also I, I, I don't know whether it should be to our staff or to you, Chair, because of your uh, recommendations, but... Um, I don't know whether there's an ability to include the work. I was looking at the report dated the 3rd of May last year uh, when um, Great Barrier and, and Old uh, had their recommendations brought to the planning committee. And there was work in the recommendations that, that went through about working with, with, with Mana Whenua. Um, so, Chair, based on what I've just heard from our staff, what, um, and it may be to Megan, but what issues would there be if there was work um, around mana whenua and getting their views that we currently have to in, on the mainland, uh, with those work to be done, Megan? Uh, through the Chair, um, that would obviously still need a plan change to actually, you know, happen on the ground. And so that effectively would, well, sorry, that is absolutely what we would be doing as part of, for example, option three, if that's where we go. Um, if option two was, re was requested of us, but option three wasn't, then um, that's a little bit to Councillor Dalton's question about, you know, could you do a little bit now, you could do a bit of that bit, um, and while until you get to that kind of 2026 date, but in reality, we wouldn't do that. You'd, you'd either do it or you wouldn't do it. So, um, yeah, 
I hope that's helpful. So based on the budgetary constraints and option three, obviously, is off the table as a result of the budgetary constraints. Um, and where we're looking forward a process from a process perspective, consistency of having the same rules here, as well as uh, being applied to great, uh, Waheke and Aotea. My question is in regards to D that you've got up there, Chair, um, and it's got, it is budgeted for within the full review. What is that time frame again? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing so many dates. Is that within the next six years, so in the next five years? That's, that's really the issue because if you have a look at it, well, I, I won't get into comment because I don't, I don't this is just a question. So, so essentially it would require a bid from the planning team to move it, this work any further, through the 10-year budget, to move this work any earlier than November 2026. Because <coughs> this work will be included in, from November 2026. Um, so I guess my, I've been discussing it with the team, like what, what is the only way? The only way would be for governing body to put a request in to reprioritise through the 10-year budget because there is no way we can do it from July 1 this year. Um, but my, my D was to try and highlight that we do support the direction of our, our local boards and we do support the, the work being done um, so it's sort of like locking in that decision to be part of the, the work, including probably pre-work, pre-November 26. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we um, we have to begin the review of the uh, unitary plan in 2026. So again, that doesn't mean that, that this matter will be sorted on in 2026 or not even notified. It might be, as I think Peter said earlier, it could be a couple of years post that as we're doing the full review. It will be part of a bigger review. So it's t post okay. 2026 yeah. in reality. Yeah. Chair, I've read the um, previous planning uh, committee reports and just one more question just to our staff. Um, around the N NPS 15, and, and, and you mentioned I think earlier that it, it, it could have been done about a year ago. Would, would, would that be, uh, 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 would that be correct? I mean, I know we'd looked at it and, and looking through the, the minutes, could that have been done a year ago? Um, yes, yes, that's correct. And, and we didn't realise that at the time, we thought all of those standards should, uh, should be um, bundled together and, and put into the comprehensive um, entire plan review of the um, Auckland Unitary Plan when the, at the time that the um, Hauraki Gulf Islands Plan would, um, would also be incorporated in that. It's not until recently that we've had advice that we could actually take that one standard out because it doesn't really have too many connections with other parts of the plan, simply about helicopter noise, that we could take that out and do that as one package rather than have to wait to do the entire bundle. Thank you, Chair. And, and, and um, yeah, I'll just reserve my right, but it won't be that much of a, of a facadal for our team, Chair. Kia ora. Um, thank you. Uh, councillor, and yeah, on, on that option too, I think the big difference is that we don't have to consult and we don't need a hearing and we don't need submissions and that what takes away the hundreds of thousands of dollars of a, a full plan change. That's one move forward with uh, much more to go. Right, so we have um, exhausted uh, the speakers. Um, we have, we'll ask you all to step away, so thank you very much um, for a significant amount of information. We do have a, and could we put that up on screen? I don't know if you've had a chance to type it out yet. So we have the, a, an amendment by, <coughs> a, it's an amendment by addition from Councillor Lee and Councillor Walker. And I just, I guess, could everyone have a, maybe if we could zoom in a little bit, could that help? Uh, yeah, if that's right to make a little bigger on screen for people. Um, uh, 
if you want to, did you have any comment on? Uh, maybe you could just briefly say, um, give your piece on this item, Councillor Lee, and then we might try and include it, or if everyone wants it to go to a vote, we can let it go that way. But if you just want to explain what your the purpose of the... Okay, um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Just, I'll keep it, just the technical argument here. Um, the uh, Originally, the Altair Great Barrier Local Board really wanted a moratorium on these um, applications and it was explained to them by planning staff that a moratorium is not lawful, cannot be um, undertaken, cannot be imposed because it's not lawful. Um, a prohibited activity, so desired by the local board, uh, but shown to be not lawful. Here we have a preference for prohibited activity, which is lawful under the Resource Management Act, always has been. The Act has been amended so many times since 1991, but prohibited activity remains in the Act for a very good reason, because there are some activities that are so antisocial um, and have such an impact um, on people and communities um, that prohibited activity is considered by Parliament the best way to deal with them. Um, a lot of people now have concluded that this is the best and tidiest way um, to resolve this problem because the raft of measures which have been uh, uh, adopted or going to be, have been recommended, um, patchwork of, of, of measures, um, will not tidy this away, to be frank. It will not end public concerns. It will not, con uh, it will not give relief to neighbours um, whose quiet enjoyment of their properties, ratepayers um, and citizens, uh, whose quiet enjoyment of their property is going to be disturbed inevitably by private helicopter um, applications, helipads, recreational private helipads in their neighbourhood, whether they be in residential areas on the Gulf Islands or residential areas in the city. Prohibited activity um, is something which almost frightens staff, but it certainly there is um, officers take an adverse uh, approach to the idea and that's, that's, that's fair enough. But the fact of the matter is, members, across the Tasman and Sydney, a whole raft of areas, and residential areas, neighbourhood areas, business areas, business development areas, prohibit helipads in those areas. And, and that's in the, in the planning documents in New South Wales and in the Sydney City Council. So, and I can share that information. So what we're looking for here is to resolve the problem. The key, the key argument that persuaded, for instance, the Waitamata Local Board to back off from its original position of prohibited activity, which, it, which I think it came to in December 2021 and was changed last week um, without any workshop, on, on the fly, if you will, was the idea of how much a plan changed to achieve prohibited activity would cost. Um, and obviously, Concerned about the, the the financial problems the council is dealing with, the local board decided to back off from that prohibited activity on that argument alone. What we are looking for here is uh, how ways and means how we could deal with this problem in our budgeted um, uh, forecast budget for uh, or. Um, contingency budget going forward to deal with plan changes. Plan changes is routine business for this council. We're up to, was it 91? And they'll keep on coming and there'll be our plan changes and there'll be private plan changes that spring up here and there which we adopt. And that's a key part of our routine business, dealing with plan changes. So this is not some sort of aberration, oh dear, a plan change, how are we gonna pay for that? We need to avoid that situation 
and if you like sequence a plan change into our budget profile going forward and all we're asking for at this stage is what are the ways and means um, this council could do that and therefore consider um, uh, option four at a future date. So that's what we're asking for here. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor. Sorry, point of order, Chair. Um, just seeking your clarification. Um, are we allowed to ask questions on an amendment? Uh, I will allow it because it's complex, I think you are, so you yeah. can ask. I just need some clarification. Maybe just, Megan yeah. only, yeah. Okay, thank you. I won't cut in the queue, though. I'll just put my hand up and nice. put me at the back. Yeah. Oh, you okay. want me to go? Yes. Okay. Yep. Cool. Um, look, can I just get some clarification? Sorry, uh, Councillor Darby, on um, <laughs> the financial implications of this amendment, because I'm just I'm not clear at all. Is this asking us to spend more money, which we've got a motion on the, that has been passed about discretionary spending? So I just want to be clear. Through the chair, I think what I heard Councillor Lee say is that. Uh, He's asking how how this matter effectively could be prioritised or put into the mix of the existing workload, I guess, for the next year or two, I, I think is what I heard. Um, so that doesn't sound like additional money or resources. It's a prioritisation. Uh, the consequence of that, of course, is that other things... Well, it either can be done or other things would need to drop off in order to fit it in, and you would still need to make that decision that that, that is what you that that is what you want to do, notwithstanding whether or not we believe you can even in in law do a prohibit a prohibited um, activity in this matter. The the request is to how it can fit into the work program. I believe is that right, Councillor? Oh, sorry, am that's, I allowed to? Is that, I don't that, want to. That's absolutely your mouth. correct. Okay, yeah. Mr. Toll. Uh, Councillor Darby. Chair, I'm. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Lee. Um, I'm. I'm generally okay as a second to include this, but I, I think it might need a little bit of tidy up, uh, Chief of Strategy Assistance, around that. Um, third to last, second to last line. I, it just doesn't seem that clear, but maybe it's okay as long as we're clear here. But um, Megan, are, are you clear on those last, it's the penultimate line, third to last line? Yeah, we're talking about the contingency budget and stuff, which is why I think I tried to explain it by how it could fit into the work program, which I think is what is, uh, so that's how I'm reading that, and that's how I would come back. Is that um, okay? There's one uh, typo, I guess, or, or, or omission. Um, council adopted private plan changes because that's that's a big part of our activity as well, and therefore part of our um, budgetary expenditure in the, in this planning business. So it should have um, for future council and council adopted private plan changes. Thank you. But gen sorry, generally we don't adopt private plan changes; we accept them. Okay. Um, so we do. Look, I'll probably, I'll probably you on this it. one, as a former chair of the planning committee, uh, <laughs> accept. Thank you. Well, look, I think I'm happy to go with uh, the guidance of uh, Chief of Strategy, just so that we, you know, get it right. We could just say, could we just say, future public and private plan changes? The public ones are ours. Yes. The yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, there we go. Thanks. Um, Councillor Philippine. Chair, I just wanted to clarify, and then I didn't want to do a point of order, um, yeah. but just want to clarify that the amendment has been moved and seconded, um, which is good. And then um, I just wanted to sort of um, not ask a question, but just uh, indicate that I'll be supporting the amendment. That's all, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Ferry, question or comment, I guess, now? Thanks. Sorry. I, I'm still a little unclear about, and I think, I think my issue is the use of the words contingency budget, and I'm, I'm just a little unclear, because from what Megan said, I, I do feel like, you know, we are talking about prioritisation and stuff, but contingency budget is not a phrase I'm familiar with us using, so I'm just trying to... Eliminate contingency. Yeah, yeah, that would do it. Sorry. Mm. Just contingency is usually something we sure, have on a project to allow for, and this is not that kind of process. Sure. Yeah. What I was 
what I was, the message I was trying to get across was to avoid the idea that here is a sudden, large, one-off, um, unbudgeted um, piece of expenditure. What, what, I, what, what the information I'm looking for, and this is just information, how um, such a plan change could be included in the normal forward budget for this particular um, division. And this is sort of not proper questioning either, but Councillor Lee, my, my only concern is that uh, with option four, are you locking the, if we support this, is your assumption that we're supporting prohibited or we're just supporting a report on how it could happen? Yes. Yeah. Um, excuse me, Councillor Walker, I'm asking Councillor Lee. Not I'm, I'm not trying to slip this past anyone. This is asking for more information. We do have budgetary challenges um, and we need um, and yet on the other hand and that's and and the budgetary challenges have um, been influential I think in a number of um, groups uh, coming to the positions they have my concern is that we need to seek a, res a final resolution to this running saw really problem and therefore um, what we're looking for now is just further information. Rather than saying we're going to shut down completely uh, option four, what we need is further uh, information to, to be brought back to this committee at some time in the future so that the committee can say, well, it's just not possible, it's just not feasible, just not doable, or it is, and we can move forward. That's what I'm trying to do. Thank you, Councillor Lee. And I'll just speak briefly on your amendment. I will, because I'm trying to be as kumbaya as possible here, support it. Um, but I will just sort of mention that even the report for staff to do this alone is, is discretionary spending. So the, the work the staff will have to do to prepare reporting back to us is discretionary. So you will well know I did not support that um, discretionary spending motion because of things like this. It, it does not allow flexibility, so it, it, we keep having this request coming up for spending outside budget. So I will just say my concern is that this will keep coming up and we've already got a motion on the book saying this stuff shouldn't happen. But I will support it because I know that there's a lot of concern and it would be good to have the information on how this can proceed. Um, so yes, so we'll go to, I think the Mayor said, head like a division on, on this one, so we will move to that. Uh, Councillor Henderson, last comment. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, look, I just wanted to say that I agree with your uh, corridor completely. Um, I'm really on the fence here. I don't really know what to do, because on the one hand, I do want to be responsive to the concerns of the community and the residents involved. I think that was really uh, influential in my thinking. Um, but the flip side to that is that you're absolutely right. We can't have these unbudgeted expenditure items coming up over and over when we have a resolution that is valid and has been passed despite my objection on, on that. And, you know, I've got communities in my ward that are not getting pest traps. They're not getting the needs to take care to, that they need to, to take care of their environment that they've been doing on behalf of council for a long time. They're not getting that because of the discretionary spending uh, resolution that was passed. So I think we do need to respect that resolution. So I'm really on the fence here. I don't know what to do, Chair. <laughs> Councillor Dalton. Nice. I guess it's just another point of clarification. I thought the report wasn't going to be coming back until later. Like, the report is not in this financial year. The report is not coming back until 2026. Um, I just want that to be clarified. Because if it is, then that is something that can be budgeted for, and we don't have to be concerned about the discretionary spending this year. Um, my second point was going to be around, we heard from the officers earlier that prohibited activ activity, it might be for you, Megan, prohibited activity is a really, really high bar. Are we sending uh, ourselves off on a bit of a wild goose chase here? I mean, I appreciate getting the report back with all of that information, but... Is it, is it money well spent when we think, if we think we know the answer already? <clears throat> um, through the Chair, there does seem to be two elements to this. Firstly, it's how could it fit into the work programme? Um, the second element is the 
the the advice that, uh, about whether uh, we are able to to legally or we believe the case to make these matters prohibited is actually worth doing. And you've you've heard my advice to you before, which is we don't believe. So notwithstanding, Councillor, you're absolutely right. It is in the Act. You can make prohibited activities. Um, fact is, it's incredibly hard to do so, and, and my, my view is that I don't believe this would meet it. However, um, it does feel like we would also need to bring that advice to you as well, because then you would make a decision, notwithstanding whatever the advice is, uh, yes, you, know, you would still go for that option, for example, if that's what you want to vote for. So it does feel like there's two elements to it. Sorry, just wanted to clarify the timing of the report back. <laughs> Was it like 2026, not 2023? Because then we can budget for it. But I think Councillor Lee was saying sometime in the future. Just want to pin down the future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll respond if I could, Mr Chairman. One doesn't like to be directive or prescriptive. Obviously, this is... Um, work on this issue is, whatever happens, is ongoing. Um, given the resolutions which will be passed, um, which, which are essentially the officer recommendations, they will be passed, and that will mean that officers will be engaged in this matter um, for, for a wee while yet. And so in that context, as part of those, um, that um, work stream, um, one would assume that this um, particular the request, this particular re request, could be dealt with in that context. So the assumption is, in the reasonable future, this after all, this report has taken a long, long time to achieve from late 2021, um, and so therefore I would be um, expecting that this would this report would come back in the next two or three months. Can I, can I make a suggestion, which may or may not be helpful? Is that OK, Chair? Um, I, to be honest, Councillor Ferry, that I, I think we might just move on the, the... I don't want it to be changed, and then we debate the change. But, OK, come forward. I've let everyone else have a go, so sorry about that, well, Councillor Ferry. That's all right. You got there in the end. Um, so I was going to suggest... I mean, the, the word report has been used there, and I wonder if there's a little bit of a halfway house here, which is um, we've heard that the local boards did get some advice on this matter. So maybe we're talking about, um, rather than a full report, which does cost time and money, we're talking about a memo that actually pulls together the advice that's already been gathered as a first step. And then that has, I think, reasonably low cost, hopefully, in terms of staff time and would give us all a sense of whether the next step is, is feasible or not, which would cost more money. So that's my suggestion anyway. I don't know, um, Member Lee, if that meets with your approval, but I see the genuine concern here and the need to look at it, but I wonder if that's a way forward that limits the impact on discretionary spending. I think it, if I can maybe go from the chair, it does say report back, not provide a report. So maybe that is up to staff to figure out how to do the most affordable reporting back. Uh, Councillor Williamson. Yeah, I just want to make it clear. I am bewildered and perplexed and flummoxed about what the hell is going on in this whole lot. And I have no idea uh, what the unintended consequences or the time frame or anything else, and I will certainly be voting against it. Thank you, Councillor. And I only just received this on, from Councillor Lee, so I'm, tr I'm trying to listen to uh, the, the, the local member and support the amendment, but that is absolutely your right to oppose. Yep. I didn't write the amendment, so, yeah. Thank you. So, right, so we will put it to a vote. There's been a division called. Councillor Lee and Councillor Walker have moved this amendment. Yeah. Um, I was going to incorporate it, but Councillor Walker said no, I've seconded it and wanted it. Oh, God. <laughs> yes, you did. No, I didn't. I've not said that. Point, point of order. Not I... verbally, not by email, not by text. No. Nope. I can. You, you didn't have your. Councillor, you didn't have. Councillor, you didn't have your mic on, but both Sandra and I heard you say when I said I'd incorporate it. Anyway, 
We have moved to division, no debate on that. Can I just clarify then, are we taking a division on A to H? H, just H. Just H? Thank you. Members, you're voting on clause H of the motion which is on your screen. Chair Hills. In favour. Member Ashby. Councillor Baker. For. Councillor Bartley. For. Mayor Brown. No, against. Deputy Chair Dalton. Against. Councillor Darby. For. Councillor Fury. For. Councillor Filipina. For. Councillor Fletcher. Abstain. Councillor Henderson? No. Councillor Lee? Uh, uh, four. Councillor Leone? Four. Councillor Newman? Yes. Councillor Sayers? Yes. Deputy Mayor Simpson? No. Councillor Stewart? No. Councillor Turner? Yes. Councillor Walker? Councillor Watson. Yep. Councillor Williamson. No. Thank you. So that will be included in the s substantive. That was carried 14 votes to six. <coughs> so now we move to the substantive item. Is there any debate? I think we've gone through. Oh, Councillor Darby. Yeah, I, I do want to say some words on this, um, and I, I appreciate the um, amendment, Councillor Lee. Um, I appreciate the work the staff have done. Um, I do want to acknowledge Councillor Pippa Coombe, who um, um, has done a lot of work on this, also at the previous council, worked with um, the respective chairs of the three boards. Um, but look, I, I sort of look at this, you know, I've taken an interest in helicopters uh, and been part of... Um, uh, submissions against particular helipad applications over the years. I've made the complaints about helicopter uh, noise, low flying, etc. I've never made it to the council because, as Councillor Lee was out outlined before, you know you don't you don't know where to complain on helicopters. Um, but I was I found myself complaining to uh, Mechanics Bay Helipad. I found myself complaining to a, um, a commercial operator who were fantastic helitrans. Tony Monk responded really positively. Um, and I've also um, complained to Civil, Civil Aviation Authority, but not to this council. And I think it is, it is important that this council does clarify and create a vehicle for um, people to lodge those complaints. But, you know, in, in uh, proximity to the inner su city suburbs of Auckland, there are three commercial helipad operations, three commercial helipad operations. And then if you move out a little bit more, there's three more. So in this, close to the city centre and the suburbs, lovely suburbs of Hearn Bay, uh, you've got Mechanics Bay, Rosedale, and then the only hunger uh, one. And then you've got Auckland Airport, North Shore Airport, what's the other one, Ardmore. So there's really no shortage of commercial helipads. And then you go to the islands, you've got Okiwi and um, Claris, on Altea, and then um, Carson's Field, at the dead centre of Waiheke, and a 20 minute ride to anywhere on Waiheke, absolute maximum, and there are higher vehicles there available, Councillor Lee. Uh, so there's no shortage of um, commercial heli heliport uh, opportunities for people to use. I really struggle to find a reason why, in this day and age, let alone previously, to, to, to find that we actually are so permissive in regard to helipads in residential and sensitive areas and other sensitive areas. They are without doubt socially and environmentally uh, intrusive to a degree many of you may not know. I, I'm just, I, I, I live with helicopters over my, my home uh, most days. The noise is one thing. The air displacement, especially when they come low to land, is another thing. And the disturbance to the residential amenity and the public amenity generally, uh, particularly you know over beach beaches, say you know Hoon Bay Beach, etc., and many others, is quite significant. 
then you measure also the ecological impact, which is not adequately being picked up at the moment. I do not think so. So my message to the lovely folk of Hearn Bay, if they want to take their champagne hampers and their polo sticks somewhere via helicopter, is use a commercial airfield like Mechanics Bay. And I just noticed using AT Journey Planner, you can take the outer link and the Tamaki link and you're there in a whiff. It's uh, very convenient. Um, and on the islands, you've got those airfields I mentioned and you've, you can hire a car. There's lots of opportunities to get you to your batch. Um, so I, I do lean strongly towards the prohibited status. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm delighted we're going to be looking at, you know, guiding people on how to lodge complaints. The last part I just want to emphasise, um, Chair, is the, is the discretion that our staff have uh, to, to um, use or to, to ensure ecological reports are required for any future applications. It is vitally important. Now, I would just like our staff to make sure that they look at the Auckland uh, Unitary Plan, the, the Islands Plan, and look at every, ap every, every avenue to uh, give themselves the room to be asking for ecological reports. I'm just quite stunned that um, they have not been as forthcoming uh, in the past as I think they should have been. But look, I'm not the planning expert, but um, I think the, the community experts out there uh, are wanting a change in that regard, and uh, I think it needs to be made. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Filipina. Chair, just very briefly, if we go back to some of the reports that have been furbished in this committee um, and um, with Councillor Darby's committee, I want to acknowledge the staff um, through this whole process. If we go back and um, also want to acknowledge um, your leadership to um, Councillor Darby. If we go back to the 30th of November in 2021, we had the Hearn Bay um, Residents Association uh, come to public forum. We also had um, Elena Keith come through as well around these helicopters. So they've been around, obviously, as people have said, around this table for a very long time. But have a look at the... Um, at, at, at their uh, submissions when they came through in November. And then the report based on the, the local boards um, at Waiheke and also Aotea, and that got reported on the 5th of May. Have a look at that report in regards to it. I supported uh, Councillor Lees, and it's now been incorporated into the, in, into the substantive um, based on um, information that I heard from Megan. And, and the fact that our staff will, will, will have a look at a report coming through. Um, and um, if we have a look at the agenda items we've had, um, for us it, it, it may take up to about five, six, seven, eight months. But I think for us in regards to this discretionary spending, I think for us around the issues that have been identified, it, 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 it will be something from um, the, the two local boards um, and and um, also the issues that have been raised by our community. So um, definitely support um, your recommendations, Chair, and want to acknowledge you, as well again as um, the lead, uh, Megan Gilder. Kia ora, Councillor, thank you. Um, Councillor Turner. It doesn't matter. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, just briefly, if the, there's no one else who would like to... Oh, Councillor say. Thanks, Tracy. Look, I, I, I support this. Uh, this suddenly uh, gives the ability for any future resource consents to take in a number of other factors which haven't been able to, take in, be able to be taken in in the past, uh, particularly around the protection of wildlife and endangered and rare wildlife, uh, seabird life. Um, also, uh, I think I'll leave it at that, Richard. That's that'd be my comment. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Last calls, anyone? Cool. Thank you. And I'll just speak uh, briefly. It is quite comprehensive. This is one of those motions that probably will slightly um, please 
everyone and slightly annoy everyone at the same time. So I know especially, <laughs> especially our local boards um, and Quiet Sky Waiheke and others who, who wish that the common sense would prevail and we could do this overnight because it does seem uh, ridiculous that the situation we're in, but we do know the complex um, systems in place and the costs and the budget constraints we're under. Um, these were the number of resolutions hearing from all sorts of people um, and parts of uh, the council of what we potentially could do quickly and hopefully um, pull that forward. I know that through maybe um, Councillor Lee's uh, addition that maybe we'll be able to have a conversation around long-term plan bringing bringing something forward as well. But there, there is just not the scope in this next year to do this work, but there is the scope to pull up that, um, that option two part, the national planning standard, um, out of that omnibus. So that's a start. And then the work, as you can clearly see, that the council is pretty uh, backing a change and moving forward uh, and prioritising. So I, I'm sorry to the community um, that, and to the wildlife that this isn't fast or something that can be done. But I think all ears and eyes and compliance are are going to have to be hotter on this and we'll make sure that it's easier to complain. And I just want to say thank you to everyone around the table. It's been a long discussion, but I've tried my best to keep everyone um, happy on this. So um, we will move now. All those in favour? Any opposed? Cool, thank you very much. And we will move on now to an extension of time and we might just have a, a bathroom break if everyone would like that. Um, Councillor Walker will move an extension of time. I'll second it. Oh, and we'll have a five minute break. Thank you.
Well, thank you, everyone. We've got uh, quite a lot to get through, and I know that a number of people have to leave. So do we still have Councillor Baker, Councillor Leone online? Yes. Right, so the first up is um, item 11, uh, Riverhead, that plan change with... We would, we chose to withdraw that for information. We need more information, so that will likely come in uh, at the next meeting. Right. So we now move to Todd, um, item twelve, making operative plan change sixty-two on Oniwa Road, um, operative part. We just want to give a brief um, a brief overview, and then we'll move to questions. Kia ora, good afternoon. Um, my, my name's Todd Adder. I'm a senior policy planner in Plans and Places in Warren McLaren's uh, Northwest and Islands unit. Uh, today I'm doing two items for you on getting Plan Change 62 and 69 made operative. So I've got a short presentation that will just cover the, the process and then we'll go to the recommendation. So the first one is Plan Change, oh sorry, no. The process. Uh, this is the Schedule 1 process and today I am seeking for approval to be to make Plan Change 62 operative, which is the orange circle at the very end of the process. So we've gone through uh, notification, a hearing and we've had a decision and we've passed the appeal stage for the plan change. So the two parts of the Act under Schedule 1 that we are talking about is firstly is Clause 17, which provides the council the ability to approve and make operative the plan change. And then clause 20 is we will notify the decision to make the plan change operative. Plan change 62 is a plan change uh, on the North Shore on O'Neva Road. The, the plan change sought to rezone 1.62 hectares of light industry zone to mixed use zone and apply a building height variation control of 21 metres. Uh, in that image, I'll just point out the red outline is the original whole plan change area and today we are approving a smaller plan change site. So plan change 62 sought to rezone the sites from light industry to business mixed use with a height variation control to plan, uh, oh, sorry, height variation control of 21 metres in height. The area on the right that is purple was within the plan change area when notified, but through the submission period it had been reduced to just the area on the left to be mixed use zone. Uh, today the recommendation is to approve the plan change to make operative and request staff to do the necessary processes to notify the decision. Uh, there were no appeals on plan change 62 and all is resolved. I'm happy to take questions. Cool. I'll move, and do I have a second, Chris, your Councillor Darby, and we'll just go to questions. Thank you. Any? No? Um, oh, sorry. Member Ashby. Kia ora. Thank you for your report. Just one question from me, um, uh, just given the um, plan change. Did you, um, did you review or, I guess, consider the EWI management plans? Um, that council has on, on file in, in relation to this? In relation to this report or? Not specifically to this report, but was done through the process when we started engaging and riding the sector 42A. And I get <clears throat> just a clarification for me, because I have had some local questions around the height. The height can you just clarify, the height's basically the same, except now it won't necessarily be a big concrete block wall. It could be something much nicer with <coughs> people living in it. Uh, yes, the, the difference really is there's an additional resource consent to obtain a building to 21 metres. The current permitted height is 20.5, but now you need a consent to go to 21 metres. Thank you. Right, all those in favour? Any opposed? Perfect. Thanks, Todd. And then we move to 
Item 19, uh, plan change 69. Uh, sorry, 13. I don't know where 19 came from. I, item 13, plan change 69. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. This is essentially the same presentation, so I'm going to skip the first two slides. It's the same procedure. Brilliant. So plan change 69 is a plan change that was in for Noapai. It was for 52 hectares of future urban zone land being is it rezoned to light industry zone. There is also a precinct that has been put in through the process. Uh, today, uh, the, the application was from Oyster Capital Limited and yeah, so today I'm seeking to, uh, requesting the committee approve the plan change and I request the staff to go through the process as well to make it notified, apologies. Um, just a little bit more detail um, there, anything I have missed. Uh, they will also be applying a stormwater management plan on the site as well, flow one. The decision has been notified and there was no appeals and the plan change now is ready to be made operative. Oh, do I have any questions? Uh, Councillor Henderson. Sorry, forgive my ignorance. Could you just explain stormwater management area control flow one to me? I understand there's been some issues in Fenorpai with um, yeah, stormwater issues and things like that. So I think I might get asked about that. So I just wanted to know if you can clarify. Uh, stormwater management area control one, flow one, is one of the controls that is applied to urban areas. So it was required to be um, put in with this plan change to uh, basically apply the urban stormwater control rules. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's cool. that's, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Councillor Watson. You maybe don't have the, the answer to this, uh, and it's strictly not related uh, to this exactly, but there's a whole raft of COVID fast track applications occurring in this area. Did, did, um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a real kind of cumulative effect starting to build up here. Uh, are we aware of that within the planning division of council? Uh, plan, uh, the COVID fast track consents come through the regulatory services, but they are passed on to plans and places um, in our team. We are aware of them. Um, we have made comment on a number of them. Um, there's two parts to that. There's the initial, should this be accepted, which is confidential, and then there's the second part where we get asked for more comments on the application itself and how we consider the application overall. And you just take them on a one-by-one on a -one basis. There's no sense of tagging them all together because there are a lot of them going down to the minister not just now. They are an independent application and it's a process independent to us. Thank you. Thank you. I think that is all the... Oh, no, sorry, uh, Councillor Turner, just missed Turner. Sorry, just one thing again, not quite... The 2020 COVID-19 Consenting Fast Track Act was limited for two years, correct? To the best of my knowledge, the applications are up until July this year. You can apply. It might be soon. It's been extended, has it? That's to the best of my knowledge, um, so I'm, I'm only really uh, a part of the team that might respond to them. And that gazumps all the other things, including the National Policy Statement on Urban Development and Plain Change 78, is that right? I wouldn't say that necessarily, it's just an alternative pathway to obtain consent against essentially the purpose of that act. Um, yeah, the purpose of that act is to rapidly or significantly increase economic and social well-being. Um, that was my summary. Um, so, but it's that alternative process that goes to the minister to consider and seeks comments from the council, um, and we will raise what we consider concerns or environmental effects that we consider need to be managed through the conditions. Thank you, councillor. Thanks, Todd. Um, oh, another question, uh, Mayor Brown. Sorry, I'm fresh at this one. I think this has been before the council before. Just how did this area perform in the last week? But any problems? Perform in terms of sorry, I missed the last part of your question. Flooding. I do not have that information for you. Sorry. 
through the chair, we can we can give that, get that to you. Um, the issue here is that it is the it's the end of the process. Um, so my my advice to you is that we need to just keep moving it and approve that through. Um, I'm happy to get you that that information, but also as we're doing that, you know, medium to long term work around flooding, if if this area uh, is pa is part of one where where we think there are some risk appetite changes and, and things that might need to do, we will talk you through that um, at that point. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's just surrounded by a stream and um, yep. flattish areas surrounded by streams have featured recently. Yeah. And so I don't want to interrupt with the process that everyone yep. else is more familiar That's with, good. but just to, to add, tell you to be a bit yeah. careful when they come to build industrial areas on this, that I'd, like, I'd just like to know that you're thinking about that at some stage, okay, not just planning. Thank you, Mayor. And I think, yeah, that the only tricky we um, part of the work we've commissioned, this committee's commissioned, includes current plan changes, but unfortunately this one, the last decisions were notified two weeks before the flood, so we have very little um, ability. But I think, hopefully, if there's changes to the ability to resource consent in this area due to floods, maybe that comes out of the, the study, potentially. Um, thanks for your work on this, Todd. Um, and we do I have a mover? Yeah. Member Ashby, seconder? No. Nope. Yeah. Councillor Turner, all those in favour? Aye. Anyone opposed? Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Todd. Right, now we move to item 14, speeding through. Um, the endorsement of Watercare's draft drought management plan 2023. Um, Megan will bring the uh, introduce and bring stuff up to the table and I think we have water care online <coughs> Kia ora, thanks um, mr. chair um, very just quick introduction uh, the matter before you uh, is water care's proposed drought management plan uh, there was a particular uh, debate and conversation about this in the 2020 drought uh, in the previous term uh, and water care and council staff have been working on an update to the drought management plan for water care. Uh, I want to hand, please, to Mark Bourne and Amanda Singleton. Uh, team, I think you're online. Um, we will uh, control the slide, so can you just you know, tell us next slide, um, and we're in your hands. Uh, they'll do a quick um, presentation, uh, and then uh, we have staff in the room to help um, answer questions, um, if that's helpful. Otherwise, we'll, we'll leave it with uh, Amanda and Mark. Thank you, team. Kia ora, both of you. Nice to see you. We can see you. Um, can you hear us? Uh, kia ora, kia ora. Kia ora. Yes, we can. And we can hear we you. Can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, Councillor, would you like me to uh, uh, just do a quick introduction to the purpose of the drought management plan? Yes, thank you, and thanks for the long... No, we'll just... We'll just get them to quick, briefly present. It's quite an important item. Thank you. Uh, uh, th th thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Bourne, and with, I'm Chief Operations Officer at Watercare, and with me uh, this afternoon is uh, Amanda Singleton, our Chief Customer Officer. I'm just going to go uh, very quickly through the plan. I know you've had a very uh, extensive meeting, so perhaps if I could move to the next slide, please. So the, the, uh, this plan sits within the broader framework of both the strategic uh, uh, activities Council is performing and also water care's strategic uh, imperatives, most particularly water care's asset management plan. But uh, I think I'd just like to point out that the, the drought management plan itself is a tactical plan and it's only implemented uh, when a drought occurs. Perhaps if I could move to the next slide, please. So uh, um, the starting point for the drought management plan is the drought security standard itself. Through the development of the statement of intent, Auckland Council has asked water care to operate the water supply system such that it can meet unrestricted demand in a drought that would occur with a probability of 1% per annum. So what that means colloquially is a drought that would occur once one in every 100 years. So this standard establishes the yield of the system. And what I mean by that is 
uh, it determines the volume of water that can be drawn across the collective water supply system during a drought of that magnitude. Now, one of the problems you have is you don't know how severe a drought is until the drought is over. So if a drought has the possibility or probability of exceeding the standard, that's when you would look to implement the drought management plan. And the purpose of the drought management plan is to trim demand such that you can maintain continuous supply throughout the drought, even if the drought is significantly more severe than the drought standard itself. And by way of example, the first uh, part of the drought, which occurred 2020, 2020 to 2022, was a very severe drought. In the first sort of seven months of that period, the drought was approaching a return period of once every 200 years. If we can move to the next slide, please. So the drought management plan itself describes how demand will be reduced. The plan has been prepared uh, um, uh, immediately following the conclusion of the last drought. We engaged uh, international uh, uh, specialist consultancy firm Uricon to assist us with the development of that uh, of this plan and they utilise best practice from the Australian water industry and also the South African water industry. The plan um, has been worked through with uh, council staff and uh, late last year was presented to a council committee for consideration and the feedback from a council committee has been incorporated in the version you see today. So it is designed to comply with that uh, a drought security standard which I mentioned and it has uh, um, some trigger levels which I'll explain in a moment which describes when you would impose the requirements within the plan but the most important element of the plan is the description on how savings are to be made and who makes those savings. So perhaps if we could move to the next slide, please. So kind of what's changed between uh, the two versions of the plan? So this version that's proposed replaces the uh, plan that was published in 2020. The very first drought management plan was developed in 1993. And so there's always been drought management plans and progressively those plans have improved year on year. We can move to the next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, the purpose of this plan, it picks up the learnings from the last uh, plan and uh, there are a number of changes that have been incorporated. The most significant change is the recognition of the investment made during the drought in the water supply system. So uh, additional sources of water and the expansions and upgrades of our water treatment plants. So we have greater water availability today than we did in 2020 when we went into the drought. So uh, the way in which the uh, pro a drought progresses is it, it uh, comes through in stages and it's driven off a seasonally adjusted uh, trigger levels. The, uh, um, uh, the how demand is reduced is picked up in the first instance by an enhanced communication plan and we would ask for voluntary savings from all water care customers and then progressively if the drought continued and the and the severity of the drought was continuing to deepen you would move through a series of more restrictive stages. The other thing to note is some of the actions within the plan, whilst this is specifically a tactical response to a drought, some of the ways in which savings can be generated could be used for non-drought activities. And a case in point might be uh, in response to a system outage caused by a cyclone. Perhaps uh, um, a, a treatment plant may have been severely damaged and there is a requirement for a short-term reduction in demand. So whilst not specifically response to the drought, some of the actions could be used for that. Perhaps if we can move to the next slide, please. So the drought management plan also describes the roles for the affected parties. So if we sort of step through those. So water care, our role is to run the system to comply with the drought security standard. We also have obligations to work with our customers to ensure water literacy and education, and they are always on. So those activities never stop. 
as the drought uh, progresses, we would increase that, those activities. Auckland Council has a role. In the first instance, it would be the declaration of restrictions if required. Those restrictions are able to be put in place uh, in line with the uh, uh, Auckland Council bylaw. Water, uh, the the uh, council hasn't delegated the, that responsibility to water care. That remains with council. So if uh, um, if restrictions were put in place, Auckland Council has a secondary role, and that would be demonstrating leadership in the demand reduction activities if they were required. And then that links link, links us to the third leg of the stool, our customers, and their role to play is following those demand restrictions if required. In the first instance, voluntary savings, and then mandatory savings if the uh, restrictions are implemented. So it's very important that uh, uh, once approved, the drought management plan is published and each of the parties understand their roles and obligations with it. In the development of the plan, uh, we've worked very closely with our, uh, our customers, both residential customers and commercial customers, so that they uh, we could get feedback as to what worked well with the last drought management plan and what areas of specific improvement we could incorporate into this plan. If I could move on to the next slide, please. And that sort of brings me to a point where we can pause and uh, Amanda and I can cover questions. I do have a slide because I'm anticipating a specific question around uh, changes between the trigger levels of this plan and the last plan, so I can bring a slide up to cover that as well. Yeah, maybe if you just want to put that slide up while we're asking questions sure. as well. Perfect. Okay, okay. any... Um, um, oh, sorry? Oh, sorry. Cool, thank you, and um, just want to, yeah, thank you for working with our um, staff teams and also um, changing the original triggers, which I was quite triggered by at the time. They were just far too low, and I think we've hit the right spot now with the amount of um, work that can go into the education side of things, and that stage one, uh, it feels silly talking about it now with all the rain we've had, but uh, there will be a time that we need people to jump earlier than maybe they felt was appropriate last time whether that was real or not, um, that was perception. So, um, Councillor Walker, you have a question. A fairly minor issue that I've alerted the officers to, and that's on page um, 40 of the, um, of the plan, uh, where it refers to um, general outdoor cleaning, and effectively it allows a dispensation under stage two to the exterior yeah, um, building washing um, industry um, who have developed uh, standards, uh, training, uh, best practice. What applies in stage two should also apply in stage one. It's pretty easy. If you can make that change, that'd be great. Okay, I've run that past the officers. I think they're reasonably comfortable with it. Was and just by the by, all of the councillors had the exterior cleaning industries manual uh, preliminary manual at this time put in their uh, letterboxes. These people really know what they're doing. Thanks. Thank you. Was there a comment on that, uh, Mark or Amanda? Uh, yes, Amanda. I'll, yeah, I'll comment on that, Councillor Hills. Um, Councillor Walker, um, actually, it's stage one has no restrictions for exterior cleaners. Um, it is voluntary and um, they can continue to um, wash um, exterior um, areas, whether it's houses or um, commercial buildings. Um, so actually, it, it's already covered. And um, in, um, I think the page you're referring to, it's specific, it speaks specifically to residential um, restrictions where it says residential customers are allowed to wash their own houses using um, water blasters um, for 10 minutes a day during um, stage one. But if you go to the next section where it speaks to um, commercial customers, actually exterior cleaners and specifically mentioning the ECIA are allowed to do it um, without restriction in stage one as well as stage two. So uh, it's covered. If we need to make it more clear, happy to do so. 
Well, I would just suggest that the exterior cleaning industry came back to me on this, so it certainly wasn't clear to them. Thank you. Cool. We'll ensure that feedback goes back, because that's what I had thought the recommendation was, because it does make it um, clearer and simple, and for safety and um, cleanliness for private residents as well in that stage one area, you know, when there was slippery things. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Member Ashby. Kia ora, thank you. Um, I've just got three three pretty quick questions. The first is, um, you've uh, it's really around iwi engagement, um, and I see that you've engaged through the um, through the forum you run. Just wondering why you didn't engage direct with those iwi and the Waitakere's and in the Hanuas. Um, so that's just question one, particularly given the importance of water. Um, question two is uh, the report talks about the uh, Waikato River management plan, um, but I'm unclear as to engagement with the actual iwi. Um, and then the third question is just, um, I'm presuming, but I don't know, um, that your Māori Outcomes team were also involved um, in this. So those are just my three questions, thanks. Okay, shall I start, Mark? Um, Thank you for that question. We have, um, as Mark said earlier, um, consulted quite extensively. Um, as you know, may or may not know, we do um, consult iwi ongoing through our Te Rua Fetu um, team. And um, for the drought management plan, Te Rua Fetu also advised that um, it would suffice to consult the Kaitiaki Forum um, which we have done, taken them through it, incorporated some of their feedback, and um, you know it was felt that because it's a a plan that is not regional or that is not um, local area based, but is really for the region, um, that forum would would be sufficient for consultation purposes. In addition to the ongoing conversations during the drought and immediately after the drought with a number of stakeholder groups and partnerships like iwi. And just to further extend the uh, answer with specific relationship to uh, Waikato Tainui, uh, as part of the uh, Board of Inquiry process, we have specific consultation uh, uh, programs in place with Waikato Tainui, which also in extends to uh, demonstrating uh, water efficiency within uh, Tamaki Makaro. So the drought management plan is very much a subset of our wider water efficiency program. The drought management plan per se is very much a tactical plan that uh, potentially uh, is only likely to be used um, about on average once every 20 years or so. And certainly if we have a look at history, uh, um, it's about a 20 year interval between restrictions being put in place. So, so I, I think elevating these uh, um, the conversation away from the drought management plan to broader water efficiency programs is a more appropriate uh, forum for, in particular, iwi engagement. Kia ora, thank you. Just um, one very short follow-up is uh, just a reminder, perhaps, to Wataki that um, not all iwi attend that forum, um, and so just just be mindful of um, not using that to discharge your treaty responsibilities when you don't have all your treaty partners in the room. Kapoi. Kia ora. Kia ora, thank you, Member Ashby, thank and, you. and we, yeah, that would be my um, view to, as with the water strategy we did, Kaitiaki Forum, but also individual mana whenua chairs in every um, step, so that would be great. Um, Councillor Dalton, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Mark and Manda. Uh, just two questions. Is the ongoing collaborative work going to continue to be, or to be jointly scoped with Council? Uh, uh, sorry, Council, we were referring specifically, uh, by way of example, the development of a peak management plan yep, and yep, those activities. that's a good example. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So there's there's a number of obligations uh, within the uh, Auckland Council's water strategy that we're still working very much jointly on. Uh, I, I think the uh, um, uh, it would be very difficult 
to separate um, the activities that water care is responsible for and the activities council is responsible for. So the most efficient solutioning is by bringing these things together in a co collaborative working party. Thank you, Mark. And uh, do you have a communication strategy or plan to tell Aucklanders about the new trigger levels? Um, yes, Councillor Dalton, we have, um, and it is a communication plan that we can really take off the this shelf, dust off, and um, put into place like we've done, as you may or may not be aware, during the floods even. Um, but water efficiency is an ongoing part of our communication and customer engagement. So even in times of floods, we continue to ask um, Aucklanders to um, use water sparingly or wisely. Um, and um, as this plan indicates, we have um, various stages of communication which specifically looks at um, increased awareness in as soon as we see potential for a drought and then during the drought certain um, step up levels um, through owned, earned and um, bought media. Thank you both, great work. Through the chair, if I may just uh, offer a little comment which might just help uh, understanding um, in relation to the trigger levels. The trigger levels themselves are dynamic and will change uh, with population growth as demand increases or if uh, additional production capability is uh, extended. And, and that's actually uh, annotated in section 3.1 of the plan. So whilst the drought management plan itself, we're asking for that to be approved, uh, um, there will be regular reviews of the plan, but also regular reviews of the drought um, the trigger levels that determine when the plan needs to be updated. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Turner. Uh, thank you. First question, those triggers, they're, they're not fixed then. It's not a, a fixed review at a certain time. You, it's a kind of dynamic thing that depends on parameters of, of nature before you review it. Is that right? Uh, it, it's not so much... It's not so much driven by the weather per se, it's, uh, but, the, but the trigger levels will be reviewed every year. So as part of our annual planning cycle, we determine what we uh, think demand will be in the future years. And also we would then look at what changes have taken place in their production ability. So by way of example, uh, um, over the last uh, seven months, uh, we've had to sh close down the Onihanga water treatment plant. So that's removed production capability. So one might then think, gosh, we should actually change the trigger levels. Uh, um, demand, however, has been suppressed and, ha and our forecast for demand over the coming years is we don't anticipate the anticipated level of growth we had planned for. And also, uh, uh, later, uh, before the start of the new financial year, an additional treatment plant will be opened, the Papakura water treatment plant. So each year we'll review the, the trigger levels, uh, um, but the, it's actually the input to the trigger levels that are reviewed, the, the demand forecast and production ability, and the combination of those two factors would then influence trigger levels. Sorry, I can't recall inside the document it actually having specified when those, you know, a time frame which you will, regardless of all this stuff, review it. Uh, um, we, we've, we've documented within the plan that the plan will be reviewed every second year, and we've also uh, indicated that the, uh, the trigger level graphs will be uh, reviewed more frequently than that. I think our language could have been better, more frequently than every second year is annually. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to say, I, I, being the water care lead, um, when I read through this um, document, I just got a sense of, um, of uh, responsibility maybe 
should be shoveled off the public and on, uh, sorry, off water care and onto the public. And I, I rang Mr. Bourne and spoke to him, and he answered my questions all very, um, very well, and, and I was happy. But it was not until this morning that I was aware that this is back after having been in front of the committee in the last term. And so I, I have to be led by the people who were here last term and know what they'd asked to be improved on to, to know that, you know, make sure you guys are happy with what you'd not, what, what you'd sort of rejected last time. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. And I, I guess it wasn't necessarily like a rejection, but I, uh, I as Chair and, and other members had concerns with that the trigger levels were maybe <coughs> too low and, and what my and um, council staff assumption was that the drought would have to be quite drastic compared to the last drought to then hit that lower trigger level because we have more water. And so my kind of view and others around the table was that, yes, we understand we dropped the trigger levels because we have more capacity, but it's also good to start the conversation slightly earlier to get that behaviour change because we've seen the behaviour change now. Um, is a lot cheaper than building a whole lot more infrastructure in a rush like we had to do last time. So getting that behaviour change starting. A lot of what people did during the drought was not actually part of the trigger levels, it was the education side. So a lot of people kept saying to me, can I have a bath now? We never ever restricted people from having a bath, but people thought that they had to um, reduce their water use and were very clear that they were, but actually m most of the trigger levels were pretty minor, such as having a nozzle on your hose instead of leaving it and not watering your, um, not having sprinklers in your garden. So they were, and washing your car, they were quite minor compared to what maybe people thought they were. So that behaviour change made a huge difference and is still paying dividends now because we are considerably down. I think we got up to 540 million litres a day the summer before the, the, um, the drought, which was bad. Uh, and now we're sort of between 380 and 420 um, a million a day, even after the drought situation. So, um, yeah. So, so you're telling me council asked for the trigger levels to be lifted? Um, yes. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right. There's no more questions. Um, Councillor Turner, you said you would like to move this uh, earlier. Councillor Walker. Okay. Councillor Walker um, would like to move. So Councillor Turner asked me last night, but I'm happy for whoever to do whatever. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mark and Amanda, and thank you to the, our um, council team um, for all your work as well on this. And we hope that the, and we know the relationship, whatever it looks like, um, uh, when the changes happen as well, I'm sure we'll continue um, to work together on this because we all work for the same people. So th um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Kia thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all those in favour? Or is there any? I assume there was no debate. Apologies. Um, <laughs> Cool, thank you. Right, we're now onto the infrastructure strategy, the long-term issues for Auckland's infrastructure. <coughs> we have Megan and Greer. I'll just move this and Councillor Dalton would like to second. And we'll just hear the presentation. We'll just watch the, uh, just have the brief presentation and then go straight to you, Councillor Walker. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Ko Greely's tokoingo. I'm the manager of the infrastructure strategy team that sits in CPO. Um, we've got a short presentation. Um, you've seen the report, hopefully. We'll run through the key points. Um, Megan is going to run through the presentation and the key points and then we can move quickly to the <laughs> discussion. Kia ora koutou. my name is Megan Howard. Um, we are here today to talk about updating the 2021 infrastructure strategy for the 2024 LTP. Um, that document will be adopted as part of the LTP next June, um, but we're here early to get some direction on the significant issues for infrastructure that will be used to develop that strategy. Right. The infrastructure strategy itself is a 30-year document. It's required by the Local Government Act and it's there to reassure our communities that councils are planning for infrastructure in the years beyond the 10-year budget 
portion of the LTP. So it enables us to look at long-term issues alongside the kind of trade-off and budget setting decisions that are made in that 10-year budget. The strategy covers council's infrastructure assets. It covers portfolios of transport, regional and community parks and facilities, waste, urban regeneration, and in, in whatever form we're directed to by water reform, it may or may not cover three waters. Um, all of those assets are long-term assets, so we need to plan in the long term for them. Uh, it's also worth noting that the infrastructure strategy is really closely audited, and our auditors are looking to see that we're aware of and planning for the big issues that are going to face our infrastructure systems. All right, so the infrastructure strategy forms part of the long-term plan document. Um, it plays a role in the LTP of testing the assumptions and the evidence that we use to build our infrastructure investments. Um, what the infrastructure strategy can do is provide a level playing field for looking across all of council's infrastructure investment. And to do that, we work really closely with council infrastructure providers and with their asset data. And we use a standardised criteria for looking across our infrastructure planning. What that process enables us to do is to ask and answer questions around are we managing our asset risk? So are we renewing and maintaining our assets so that they can perform their functions? Are our planned solutions and investments fit for purpose? And does our investment deliver the best return and investment over the long term? So they're all ways of asking how can we spend efficiently in the long term? So we need to start the infrastructure strategy with a clear set of long-term issues. And we need to do that for two reasons. Firstly, because we are required to under the Local Government Act, audit will test us on that. And also because if we are clear now about the, the issues that we see enduring through the 30 years of the LTP, we can plan for them. So it gives us a consistent framework for understanding the long-term implications of how we're choosing to invest now. Right. Uh, the report that we've tabled today sets out our staff analysis of the issues for 2024. Uh, in 2021, you can see that we used five issues, greenhouse gas emissions, resilience, inequity, funding gaps and growth. We've gone back to our infrastructure providers and confirmed that those issues are still relevant for long term planning. Uh, we are also proposing the addition of two issues for 2024, Tiao Māori infrastructure and environmental degradation. Both of those new issues are significant in central government direction. They are significant in the strategy that council has agreed with our communities, and they were seen as areas for greater progress in the Auckland Plan Progress Report, which was shared with this committee earlier in the month. So they are live issues for building and understanding our infrastructure investments. Uh, all seven issues are long-term issues. We know that their, their relative importance and urgency will change at various points in the 30 years, but we expect that they will endure. Uh, and so the issues will be used in the LTP to direct focus and direct scenarios uh, for the development of investment um, and then those priorities are considered and balanced in that 10 year budget making decision. And just a little more on how the issues inform the LTP itself. Uh, as you can see on the left hand side, we have the seven issues that we're proposing greenhouse gas emissions, resilience, growth, inequity, funding gaps, te ao Māori infrastructure, and environmental degradation. Those issues get built into the tools that we use to inform the LTP. So those tools are the central list there. Um, the issues become cornerstones for those tools. Uh, and there are two types of tools in a way. There are tools that we use to build our investment plans. The first three, we have a strategic investment framework, the asset management plans themselves, and an investment hierarchy. And the issues also get built into the tools we use to test and measure our infrastructure investment. So our investment prioritisation tool and the accountability requirements of Audit New Zealand. Uh, what you can see on the right hand side is that those tools 
eventually provide advice for LTP decision making, which then becomes part of the LTP documentation. Uh, they do that by informing trade-off decisions and scenarios that are considered for infrastructure investment, and then eventually they're captured in the infrastructure strategy document as a most likely scenario for infrastructure investment. So I want to be clear though that ultimately the prioritisation ha decisions happen in the LTP decision making, not in the infrastructure strategy, uh, but the infrastructure strategy issues direct the focus and the scenarios that we consider in the development of the 10-year budget. All right, this is a place to stop. Um, these are the resolutions in our report. We are asking for endorsement of the issues and asking that uh, this committee proposes to the governing body that these issues are used to consider infrastructure investment um, plans for the LTP. Thank you, awesome. Uh, we have two questions so far. Councillor Walker, first up. Just to sh short circuit things, Mr Chair, I, I plan to ask my question and make a comment at the same time. Okay. Um, the most significant item that needs to be added to the list of issues, if you can go to that, is broadly technology. There's a revolution that's happening right now. It doesn't have to be foresighted because it's real. And it is the phenomenal development that's occurring across, across electrification, battery development, associated buffering, um, full self-drive, which is imminent within a number of years, if not um, in the near horizon, and renewables. Uh, it's been driven by companies like Tesla and BYD. So you're seeing exponential uptake of electric vehicles. You're seeing the price driven down. You're seeing vehicles being produced by press technology. Um, that is happening. It's going to be akin to the shift from the horse to the motor vehicle. That's what's happening right now. It's akin to what happened in terms of smartphone technology. So it has to be up there. It has a huge impact on funding because we don't actually have to fund it, the marketplace and people will fund it because the vehicles are cheaper and they're cheaper to run, particularly given that most people don't actually buy a vehicle outright, they actually lease it, so the running costs are, are less. And if you have um, the development of the robot car, which you won't even have to own, uh, then the uptake will be so fast, it'll be scarcely unimaginable. So I'd just make a plea that technology needs to be up there. Um, if it's not, we are discounting the most significant thing that influences all of the others in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, resilience, inequity, funding gaps. Okay? And it is not simply a response. <coughs> funding is a response. This is an issue. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, I'll ask for its staff response. I mean, I guess technology is across everything since the wheel, I guess. So um, I don't know how to respond to putting that as a a new issue. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's akin to the others. I mean, what are the others? What's growth? Yeah, so I might just get an answer for, from... Yeah, kia ora. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Councillor Walker, for the question and for giving us a heads up about your thoughts beforehand. Uh, we we do see, as I mentioned earlier, that, that technology is more something that we would deploy in response to the fact that we are facing these issues. Um, I definitely take your point about the fact that uh, technology is changing constantly and at a, at a huge rate. Um, and our infrastructure assets need to respond to those. Um, I guess the, th the third thing is that we don't provide the power network, and so we're, we've got an infrastructure strategy for our for our assets that we our infrastructure assets that we own and manage. Um, but we respond, I guess, to the the changes in the power network. We we look at those issues, but but we're not looking to to put them as an issue in themselves. Um, we, we're happy to consider technology as something that sits on the issue side rather than the response side, um, but in the previous infrastructure strategy, that's how we have seen it, as a response. Through you, Mr Chair, just by way of response, 
I mean, we, uh, unlike other cities, and I can point to any number of others, we don't have an energy strategy, uh, yet it is one of the most significant things that imp impacts on our city. Just because we don't have things doesn't mean to say that they aren't things that we influence. So we should be. We have a water strategy, for example, and water goes beyond the simple deployment of the water that we control. It's broader than that. Energy is much the same. This is not something that we are uh, deploying. It's happening, and we are responding to it. So in much the same as we are responding to greenhouse gas emissions, we are responding to issues around uh, resilience. We are also responding to technology, and particularly the technology that I'm describing. Um, I mean, other cities have it up there. I could enumerate any number of others. It is the most significant um, thing that we should be considering. If we were in Los Angeles, for example, um, you know, we wouldn't even be having the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Baker. Um, evening. So just I see where you've, um, in the issues, you, you've defined equity as providing basic services equitably and providing services to support communities of greatest need. How have you defined greatest need? That was the, uh, the framing that we used for the 2021 strategy. We would likely use similar phrasing around communities of greatest need. Um, it's something that uh, we was embedded in the, in the previous LTP using um, primarily data around um, deprivation index scores. Um, but there, we do have work ongoing to understand that in the context of uh, infrastructure. Through the Chair, if I could just add to that, Councillor Baker, I think this is a conversation we want to have with you through the LTP as well. So while this is particularly helps to frame where the infrastructure strategy might go, it's really important for the 10-year long-term plan as well. So we'd like to keep talking to you about this and about what that looks like for you when you make your decisions on the long-term plan as well. But if I can think of... I, I can make an assumption what um, Andy was alluding to. I think it's an important point that inequity isn't just around potentially income. It could be inequity based on p what part of the city you live, access to infrastructure, rural communities, which, um, as I'm sure Greg as well would attain to, is that we often miss, or the, or the <coughs> discussion can miss, our rural communities, which are some of the biggest in New Zealand, but not seen as often part of the city. So, thank you. Uh, Councillor Darby. Thank you, and thanks, Graham team. Uh, in the growth area, the growth issue, um, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot and thinking about how we, how a growth is not just um, accommodated, but infrastructure draws growth into particular areas, and often it's it's running counter to a strategic plans possibly and even um, you know plan changes it's it you know there's um, say an infrastructure provider like Auckland Transport or Waka Katahi's could kick off a designation process and next thing you're on a journey of infrastructure that you didn't anticipate just because uh, an entity uh, kicked off um, um, you know that process so and I know you're aware of this problem uh, is this likely to get us into that discussion of how to deal with those sort of these disparate moving parts all trying to do good but often the outcome is bad uh, Kia ora. thanks for the question Councillor Darby um, the, the infrastructure strategy itself really responds to council's strategic direction, and so the key piece of direction that we'd be responding to would be the future development strategy once adopted. So the, the strategic direction in there around growth um, will, will then guide 
how we respond and provide uh, infrastructure to support that growth. Uh, the FDS is working with other parties as much as we, as, to what extent we can, um, to sort of manage that almost uncoordinated um, nature of some of those infrastructure impacts, giving us growth in places we didn't necessarily anticipate it to. Um, but in terms of the, the issue that the infrastructure strategy does address is around yeah, coordinating infrastructure investment to support growth in the right places. Um, and that right places bit being about spending our investment for growth in the places that it, it's most likely to be and that it's going to be most efficient to support growth. Does that answer? Yeah, look, we question? can have another discussion. It's a, it's a big conversation. Um, let's leave it there for now. I, I know it's on your radar. Yeah, thanks. Cool, thank you. That looks like to Councillor Philippine, no question. Right, up oh, Councillor Fletcher. A small question, but it's of Megan Tyler. How does this align with the policy work that's being undertaken with the Transport and Infrastructure Committee? I just want to make sure that we're not getting involved in terms of duplication. Um, and I know that from my perspective, it's really important that when we're looking at growth, we're factoring in Plan Change 78, all of these sorts of things. Um, so m perhaps Megan can give us an overview where under the long-term issues of Auckland infrastructure, the body of work sits with this committee and where it sits with the Transport and Infrastructure Committee. Through the Chair, thanks Councillor Fletcher. And this is something we'll continue to just work through as we have been the last few months. In terms of the terms of reference, it's quite clear that this committee sets the strategic direction or, or the policy uh, for Council, uh, including around infrastructure, and um, that the Transport Infrastructure Committee is the outworking or the delivery of that. The exception there is, of course, the uh, Regional Land Transport Plan, which um, and the CCO uh, accountability with Auckland Transport, that sits with uh, with the, with the uh, Transport and Infrastructure Committee uh, and the RLTP as a policy, a piece of policy street direction sits with that. But otherwise, this committee would set the direction um, and then the outworking of that, the delivery of that, um, would be through the Transport and Infrastructure Committee, for example, like light rail or additional harbour crossing, um, you know, updates on, on water infrastructure, for example, um, that you're working through at the moment. So th this this is a very this is a key strategic document that for the council. The thing here, though, is it also connects to the long term plan, which of course is uh, finance and governing body matter. And so that's why you see in B, we don't want to duplicate. We, we don't want to take uh, responsibility out of either the transport committee or governing body. So we want to do it in the right way. And in this case, we will we will pull it up into governing body because it will ultimately be part of the the broader long term plan conversation which in time will flow back to your committee um, uh, in the Transport Committee to see the outworking of that. Is that helpful and, and can I provide any more advice? I, I, I think it's a, the beginnings of a really good conversation, um, but I do struggle a little bit with the delegation of the transport plan that the Mayor is particularly keen to see developed because I, personally don't think you can divorce transport from the broader issues of infrastructure and growth. Yeah. So it's really important to me that there is clarity around the alignment um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do whatever I can to make sure that there is that ongoing dialogue um, and I'm sure the same for the Chair, uh, Councillor Watson, but thank you. Thank you. Look, um, certainly as staff, we, we want to try and make this as workable and practical as possible. So please, let's just keep talking about that uh, as, as chairs and deputy chairs, but also as staff about making sure we're doing the right thing and that we are aligning, because it's exactly what we all want to be doing. So appreciate your assistance. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Walker. A specific request for inclusion, Mr Chair, am I to assume that's been integrated or do I need to make an amendment? Uh, look, I mean, I see your point, but uh, I guess my, 
It's not a concern. I think the, the, your view has been given, but I mean, essentially technology is just the use of knowledge um, to... It's, this is fundamental, Mr. No, Chair. No, I know, I know. I, I guess I mean, at, if you would let me finish just for a second. So, I mean, technology generally is just the use of our knowledge and skills and science for the ability to do everything Council does, including all uh, the issues above. So I've enumerated you, specific technology. And that technology goes specifically to infrastructure and especially to transport. It is not being adequately factored by this organisation at all. The consequences on our budget, the consequences on climate change and everything we do are nothing short of staggering. It's happening now. Uh, we shouldn't be like a dinosaur. Um, it's, it's relevant to everything up there. Exactly. Um, so I at, guess at, at what point do we get real about this, Mr. Chair? So I guess it's a matter of opinion it's whether to add an... Yeah. Well, I guess it's, to me, my view is that technology isn't an emerging <coughs> issue. Technology crosses everything because it's the ability to do everything we do. Technology is just using your knowledge well, and science. What's, what's funding then? I mean, it's, it's as relevant, if not more relevant, than any of the factors. Councillor Henderson, sorry, you had. Thanks. Correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like you're both agreeing with each other vociferously that technology touches upon every single thing on the board. So I don't see what the problem is. Why can't we just pass the recommendation? Yeah. I just don't have the, so if it sends up another stream, I guess my, the, if we're talking the definitions of technology, it crosses everything council does, it's just the. Um, I gave some specific examples, Mr. Chief. I know, but that's. I'm happy to work on this with the officers. Okay, I mean, I'm happy to take it as feedback, but I don't think we need to add it as an emerging, as, an, as its own separate issue. Technology is. <laughs> I beg to differ with you, Mr. Chair. If you want to defer this item, fine. If the officers need some time to consider it, if they need some information, I'm sure that can be provided for them. But it is basic, and it is happening, and it is revolutionising the transport space and the energy space, and they are two of the most key parts of infrastructure that we actually have to deal with. OK, well, look, I'm not trying to be difficult, but we didn't ask everyone for things to add to the emergence, emerging issues. And I would say what you just said is that happening has always happened since the dawn of time as technology has led yeah, those true. issues. Yeah. I'm Count. simply putting it to the meeting that it's something pretty simple that could be added. I don't think the officers are disagreeing with me. The only person that's largely disagreeing and being difficult is you, as far as I'm concerned. Points of order, can we please have some respect for the chair? I well, think, not but me. you're not respecting the rules around how we conduct these meetings, actually. So I, I would appreciate it if we could have things like speaking lists and stuff like that. Cool. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Turner. Look, I'd just like to say um, the way I'm listening to the conversation as a tradie. You know, when I started in business as a mechanic 40 years ago, you did a clutch job on a car every two years. Now you'd be lucky if you do one. That has a huge impact in how you set up your business, how you how how you finance things. What it, it you know it changes everything. You know the modern car. It is just as you say, technology growing. But I do understand what um, uh, the council is saying that it that it has a dynamic effect materially at the other end of the. So it, you know I, I it's kind of supporting both of you, but I do think that that it can fit in there with all the other things just like growth because I think we do have to work out what the technology is going to do to how we present ourselves physically, d dynamically, financially in the future. Thanks. I mean, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, 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 I think, um, firstly, we must also go through all our agenda, through all our committees, and put in technology. We, we need to do that. 
we'll, 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 we'll put technology in, in all of our recommendations because that's exactly what we should be doing. So, Chair, from, from my perspective, I agree with you. Technology does cover everything that we end up doing. And if we're going to pick little things that we can put in technology, we might as well stay here till 10 o'clock and then wait for the, all the other agendas to come up. It just seems silly that, and, and I think, Councillor Williamson, you ended up, which was great, when at, at, at one of the other items we had, when you said, what the heck is happening? I agree with you in this regard too. What the heck is happening? I mean, for us to end up cherry picking the word, um, you know, to do that, Chair, I think we should move on. I totally agree in regards to your stance and not to put in technology. And just let's move on to the next agenda. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ferry. So I'll move it as an amendment, Mr Chair, and I'll call for a division. Okay. Well, quite happy to do that. well, technically you had your speaking to an earlier, so I shouldn't allow an amendment. But, but Councillor Ferry. Um, I was just going to say that I, I feel like technology is a part of all of those issues. And I see, for example, we don't have climate action up there because, again, it's at the core of, of what this work is. We don't need to put it in as a separate one of the seven significant infrastructure issues. And adding an eighth, um, you know, I, I think it does have implications for the way the work will need to be done when it is something that actually is woven through all of the ones that we see in the seven. So um, I agree with the chair. I think we just move forward, please. Okay. Councillor Newman, you had a question. I mean, well, is this questions or comments? <coughs> At this point, I have no idea. Sorry? <laughs> At this point, I think everyone's having their says and... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the whole purpose of the emissions trading scheme is to allocate capital to invest in technology so as to reduce emissions. Um, the whole purpose of technology and buildings actually is to try and reduce emissions so as to lower the carbon footprint of buildings. Um, much of the work of the Climate Change Commission is around promoting EVs to reduce emissions through the application of new technology. I suspect some people don't like that bit because they don't like the idea of vehicles on the road, but, but it is still nevertheless uh, technology that is the imperative around this. I, I, I'm sure that some people don't really um, have that much of an interest in uh, technology opportunities per se, but they are fundamental uh, to the infrastructure issues that need to be grasped as per A. If it could be included, that would be fine. I think that would hopefully address it. If other people are absolutely intrinsically opposed to it, that's fine. They don't have to be worried about that. I think that this is a matter that could simply be addressed by inclusion, um, and hopefully we can just move on from there, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dalton. I just think that as a council we've been really quite good at technology. Um, we've proven that through the Value for Money Committee and that as technology um, develops we use it, otherwise we'd be still using a gestetna to print our agendas off. We move with technology and we have some really good partnerships that enable that. I mean, I'm, I'm reason, reasonably relaxed as to whether it goes in there or not, but I can, I can completely understand that technology drives everything that we do. It doesn't matter what the topics are. Technology is a fundamental principle of what we do. It's a bit like when I used to talk about <clears throat> climate and say, actually, it should just be in every decision we make now it doesn't need to be up there as a separate thing. It's a key driver, as is technology. Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, I've, sp I've spent the whole meeting trying, to, trying my best to keep everyone happy. I guess I wasn't trying to uh, dismiss your comments, Councillor Walker. I was trying to say that technology is already included right along, and I'm worried that if we silo it, it doesn't necessarily make... You know, it's it's a given that it's included, but I'm I'm like. Well, it's, it isn't a given, otherwise it would be up there. It's not the chair. I, yeah. <coughs> so, 
I guess we shouldn't have really been having the debate with the staff there unless you have anything to add, but you probably don't want to at this point. <laughs> um, Councillor Lee, last... I'll be very quick, um, Mr Chairman. You've, you've, you're managing a, a very um, heavy agenda and some very challenging issues. I think the last thing we want is a division. Um, a division are, divisions are exactly that. Would it hurt just to slip in the word technology amongst those commas and we all move on happily? Um, you know, is there, uh, Megan, is there a way to include technology without making it one of the issues? Because I don't know what actually <coughs> making it its own silo issue actually does. Or is it best just to add it in? And I have a it? suggestion. Why don't we make it endorse the significant infrastructure and technology issues to inform the 2024 infrastructure strategy? And that actually elevates it. And then we don't have an eighth issue, which does create um, problems around the work. Seconded. Agreeing that it's an issue, I'm elevating it. The significant infrastructure and technology issues to inform the 2024 infrastructure strategy. I think strategy. Councillor Ferry right is raising a really constructive pathway forward. I think, if, I think if we add that in there as what Councillor Ferry said... And thank you all. This is not nothing of this uh, item has gone through standing orders, so I apologise for that. Um, yeah. And then that way, technology is across all of, and that way, <laughs> Councillor Walker's point I think is covered because technology is across all the issues. Right. Thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Yes. Yes. Just to say yes for Just to say Councillor Filipina and Councillor Walker are opposed. I'll as well. Okay. Right. If we'd, and we, we did start two hours later than we were supposed to, so let's not feel too bad about the meeting. Right, now we go to, um, thank you very much. We have item 16, Summary Planning, Environment and Parks Committee information. Could I have a mover? Uh, Deputy Chair, Councillor Filipina, are you wanting to ask? Yeah, I've got a couple of uh, questions I'll make them as uh, statements as well. Well, well, well this is, Councillor Walker, this is actually what got us into trouble last time, is you asked questions and statements, and then we got confused. So I'm just trying to be we just, efficient. But that's not what... Uh, okay, I'll ask yeah. a couple of questions Thank then. you. Thank so, you. when are we going to make the changes to the Gulf Investment Plan, which is fundamentally wrong, has been legally um, challenged? So the... Off the top when, is of that, when is that going to happen? So because it's coming, in the forward, uh, in the okay, councillor, program, it doesn't indicate that. Uh, it is supposed to be coming back in the next couple of months, May. June. It's May or June. Uh, I'm. Uh, we were looking at, depending on how the budget conversations go, uh, it, w it was probably going to possibly be a reprioritisation. We'd have to work with this committee about that. So that's why we've moved it um, with the kind of June, July, okay. assuming budget lands in an appropriate space. Sure. Well, I would hope that's the case because there's a large golfing fraternity in New Zealand that's deeply upset. Uh, the other question I've got just goes to the um, uh, item uh, around the um, um, fouling of, of uh, marine craft. Uh, you rejected a um, request by the uh, boating community to speak uh, today. Uh, nevertheless, there is a very real concern about the, um, the lack of facilities in Auckland and the necessity, because Council has an interest through the you know, um, sort of Biosecurity Act and, and the like to ensure that vessels are clean so that we don't have um, pests spread throughout the, the region. So the question I've got is, how are we going to address that issue if we have not had any, um, any information informing us as to, um, as to how Council is going to deal with those 
biosecurity matters across the region, which are significant. Uh, through the chair, there is a um, we've provided a memo uh, uh, as as a, as part of the report back uh, that came from the last planning uh, committee meeting earlier in the month uh, that outlines our advice to you. Uh, it effectively says if you think that um, the provision of hard stands is a core council service, uh, then that's a decision that you'll need to make through budget, whether that's annual. The annual budget, probably not in the next couple of months, but through the long-term plan. Uh, but there is nothing more that we are advising you to do. Uh, it really becomes one of a of a service issue if you think that is something council should be providing, because it doesn't at the moment. But through you, Mr Chair, the issue is not so much as to whether hard stand area is a core council service, but rather that the services that might locate on those hard stands that enable the cleaning and the anti-fouling are able to take place and that we as a council have an interest in that and we should be informed about that, which presently we are not. And it is a serious issue, a very serious issue. So the question I'm asking is how can we inform ourselves around that given that there is a requirement for us to address those issues? Thank you, Councillor. And um, yeah, yeah, the memo is there we are looking at any decision to review that or fund that as a public um, issue will need to come up through the long-term plan um, because at the moment we have lots and lots of um, things that we require of community but we don't necessarily we're not necessarily the provider of of the the service to do that right now we're not a decision may come through the long-term plan that we are and then we will need to look at how we fund and provide a service. Mr. Mr. Chair, one of the things cons that concerns me is this constant notion that we don't do something because the budget doesn't allow. We should be in a position to agree on something in principle. And there are other entities, for example, the golfing community, they can come up with a far superior plan than we can at no cost to us. So cost is not an issue. Similarly, the boating community and the like is resourced enough if we're too poor to actually do the work for us. What we have to grasp are the principles that we need to be following through. Otherwise, we're not going to be doing anything. Yet, there are enormous resources out there crying out to do stuff for us and arguably can do things better than us, Councillor, faster, so, thank you. So and at no cost. So every single, so I will just say that every single meeting, whether it's this committee or not, we're getting requests for strategies, plans, and reports, and other things that cost a lot of money, staff time, staff uh, being reduced during this process. Um, but not only that, if we do a, a, a full study on, on the needs, we need to also look at if we are to provide that service as a council, which we don't currently, that is also a significant cost. That can only happen through the 10-year budget. That cannot happen. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, <laughs> what I'm pointing out is there's actually a different way of doing things. Yes. So okay. that we don't put things off. Councillor Walker, I have taken your opinion on every single issue on this issue too. We've got a memo here and I've said there is no budget to do what you're asking right now. We don't need a budget. Well, he's that not, is, well, you can prepare that out of your own money, I guess, but that, that is not how things work. Are you not here? Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fletcher. Um, just doing a bit more of a deep dive into the issue that came before the last planning committee meeting where there was discussion around the decision making roles of the local board but the issue of harmful marine organisms um, and so it, it becomes one and I know that correspondence has been received from the Hauraki Golf Forum uh, the Haraki Golf um, Executive Officer, Alex um, Rogers, had sent the concern through on the very specific issue, and I'll probably have the name pronounced incorrectly, but Kulera. 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 Um, and Megan Tyler had undertaken to come back to us formally on that issue. Now, it might be, and I'm all for, if the private sector can provide 
uh, the facilities that are required to make sure that the anti-fouling and hull cleaning can take place in appropriate locations across the region, then that is fine. But I want to have the comfort of knowing that on the advice that we've received from Alex Rogers, who I think is a very well-respected senior officer um, with the Hauraki Golf Forum, on this issue of harmful marine organisms, that, that that issue has been specifically addressed, because it's not one that we can fob off for the next 10-year plan. I'd like to know um, if, if we can have a response on that issue. Through the Chair, I'm wondering, um, <clears throat> just given because this isn't on the agenda, if, if once you um, review the, uh, that memo and if there are other questions or, or pieces of information that you feel is important, particularly say around our role in um, regional pest management, for example, then please just let me know and I'm, and I'm happy to provide that. In terms of the specific nature of the Okahu hard stand and the decision and process made on, on that matter, um, we have been um, advised that a, um, some legal proceedings have begun uh, on the process for that decision. So uh, now, you know, a public conversation about that is not appropriate given we've got legal um, uh, action underway. However, just in terms of some of the other information, if the memo doesn't do enough, please just let me know, and I would be happy to, tr to try and help. I, I don't wish to cause any awkwardness in terms of any potential legal proceedings, but my understanding from the last planning meeting was that we were going to have more information on the invasive seaweed that was devastating yeah. Great Barrier. Um, and so I would welcome more information on that environmental issue. Thanks, Councillor Fletcher. Thanks, Councillor, and we can look into more of that information. But on the on the decision making, we cannot speak of that because of the judicial review happening right now. Councillor Filipina. Thank you, Chair. I don't want to elongate this particular item, but I just a question on clarification for Megan. Megan, did you say that um, in response to the golf investment that we will have to wait until this uh, annual plan discussions have finished and then possibly look at the uh, long-term plan in regards to doing further work on what I believe is a very good piece of work from our staff with the golf investment. Is, is, that, is that the clarity I, I'm getting from you? Yeah, through the Chair, it was one of timing. We felt that um, it would be more useful to, to get the budget conversation completed for this annual, annual budget, then bring that back and you can determine what you do and what your timing is on that. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. And last, uh, Councillor Watson. I just want to make a very brief comment, Mr Chair, is that, is that OK now? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I just uh, in terms of the, um, the report to do with the boat haul out and um, hard stand provision and bearing in mind the legal proceedings, I'll steer clear of saying anything um, much about the landing. But I just really want to put on, on record, uh, Mr Chair, my concerns um, really as to the Council uh, performance of its duties under the Biosecurity Act, uh, where Council is required to provide leadership, and I think that word leadership is yeah, really yeah. important, in activities that prevent, reduce or eliminate adverse effects from harmful organisms are present in New Zealand. So I, I think in this respect that the memo is somewhat lacking. It only mentions the closure of the landing, in actual fact, there have been other closures uh, in recent times. Uh, Pier 21, Little Shoal Bay, in addition to the landing. Milford has been reduced and Gold Hole is threatened. More disturbingly, Mr Chair, is that uh, two of the marinas that provide 25% of the region's anti-fouling capacity, that's Pine Harbour and Hobsonville, actually have planning provisions uh, active within them that would ena enable that land to be developed for, for housing. That's, that's in the unitary plan. So I, I think in respect of that leadership to, to eliminate those adverse effects, I think we are, we are, it's, it's a bit of a stretch. We may be providing some nominal education and direction, but based on our own Hull inspection surveys, only 53% of the moored boats are currently compliant. That's just barely half. 
Um, to achieve full compliance, there'd have to be a significant increase in the, in the demand uh, for haul-out facilities, and I don't think that's sufficiently recognised in the memo, uh, Mr Chair. The Ecometric report, which the memo includes, identifies as a current capacity to anti-foul 33% of boats every 12 months and 66% if, if uh, every 24 months, um, yet only 53% are currently compliant. So I would say in terms, and I, and I don't want to keep people any longer because I need to get going too, um, is that the notion at, at the end of the, the, the memo that this is somehow uh, indicative of, of leadership and uh, uh, being active in eliminating these adverse effects, that falls a long way short of that. But perhaps I will, I will pursue that with the officers, uh, Mr Chair, so not to prolong matters today. But I think it's important to put that on the record. Thank here, you. Here. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? No. Thank you. Right, no, so now we will move... Uh, Oh, there was no extraordinary items. Thank you very much to our everyone, the public, for holding on and those uh, recording today. Um, and we will now move to exclude the public from, from the following parts of the meeting. Do I have to announce anything else? No. Right, I'll move. Second, Councillor Darby. All those in favour? Any opposed? Thank you. Right, so now we will, do you need a five minutes? Yes. We'll have five minutes, so come back at 5.32.